Uh, we will begin this morning with a flag salute. There it is, led by me. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And you all really wish you were standing near Jim Holmes because every time he does the, the pledge, he does it slightly differently. He gives it, a, I think, a, a theatrical reinterpretation each time, and it's delightful. And his phone is ringing, so. It's the president. It's the president, yeah. <laughs> All right, on that note, <laughs> we will move to the consent agenda. This is a roll call item. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by County Executive Department. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote, although anyone may ask to address any consent item prior to the board taking action, and that item may be moved for discussion. Is there uh, any member of the board that would like to move an item from consent? Yeah, I'd like uh, item 11A, please. Item 11A. Is there any member of the public that would like any item on consent moved for discussion. Okay, uh, we will take up item 11A, um, but let's start first with the balance of the consent agenda. What's the pleasure of the board? Second. We have a motion, sounded like Euler, a second, Wygant. Roll call. Euler? Aye. Duran? Yes. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Montgomery? Yes. All right, we will move now to item 11A on our consent agenda. This relates to storage and membrane structures, as well as model homes. <coughs> Supervisor Euler? Yeah, just um, more to kind of highlight, I guess. Turn on my yes. microphone. Please turn your microphone on. Do it. Um, what it is we're doing here, and wanted to have a little bit of conversation uh, with staff about uh, what the genesis of this was, how we got to this point with with uh, uh, loosening this up. So if we have anybody that's available to speak to it, that'd be great. Okay. He's, Let's he's, see. Uh, I, it may just need the switch. There you go. There we go. Perfect. Um, so the building code is really silent on membrane type structures, uh, tents, and the little shade structures that you buy at Costco to park your car under. So there's been a policy within the building department for about 10 years that those are exempt. They've been a, a long time code enforcement issue that the code is really silent on. So in an effort to try to rectify some of the discrepancies and confusion with the public on what is and isn't required for a permit, we wanted to memorialize that with this update in the ordinance. Okay, where, where are you seeing this as an issue predominantly? As far as in the county where? Yeah. I am not sure Mr. Wagner would have to speak to that. Unfortunately, he's not here, but the code, I don't oversee the code enforcement. I think okay. it's pretty much general from my understanding across the county. Okay. And, um, and to be clear, these, these are not the spring form structures that we see that still will require permits. The what, I'm part Spring form, the height, the tensions, the large ones. They're big oh, tent no. structures There's that have limited to 200 square feet. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. I was just curious as to what was kind of driving this. So, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you, Supervisor Euler. Yeah, that's. that's Did you want to make a motion? Forward. We have a motion. Second. We have a motion. Euler, a second. Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right, thank you. We're going to move now to public comment. This is the time during which persons may address the board on items not on today's agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of our regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. If you have public comment to make on any item that is not on today's agenda, please come forward, identify yourself, 
and make your comment. Welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Montgomery and the rest of the board. My name is Stephen Phillips. I live in the Kingswood Estate West for 20 years. My One of my many hats is maintenance, and um, that would be mostly for VHRs, and that's why I'm here today to talk about my disappointment in the county's um, regulations, rules, whatever, on um, VHRs. And to be clear, that means vacation home rentals for anyone who is not aware of that acronym. And when I first moved into the area, it was quiet. Most people didn't know it was there. And the VHRs were second homes um, rented by the owners when they weren't using it. But now today we have this, it gets bigger every year, the uh, VRBOs, the Airbnbs. I am now surrounded by five um, vacation rentals. I have on my street and the street below me 11. My wife and I have not slept through a whole night since um, the uh, June 30th when uh, vacation stuff started. Um, nobody seems to be able to help us and it caused me to do a lot of research. And what I've discovered with uh, Placer County is basically the only um, thing going is the TOT tax. And when I talked to um, the uh, revenue department, they explained to me that it was a hit or miss that um, vacation rental owners were had 30 days from once they started their business. Oh, and let me say that I was also told in this county vacation rentals aren't a business. But she then went on to say they have 30 days to um, apply for the TOT paperwork. And um, I know for a fact that all the homes I work for up in my neighborhood and in Agate Bay do not have the signage up and do not pay the TOT. She, the lady that I talked to said that uh, the information on who pays and who doesn't was priority and that the only recourse I had would be to um, write a letter with addresses. And I says, well, what happens if there's no response? She says, that's the end of the story. She says, good luck. We then talked about uh, parking, noise. Um, she told me that uh, there was rules on parking, but when I talked to the sheriff's department, they don't have a clue about only two on the street. You can have your garage filled, your driveway filled, and only two on the street. Now, the rentals around me advertise on all the VRBO and all those sites that they sleep 17. And when I go to work in them, they have multiple beds in every room and including the loft. And when you have 17 people in a three or four bedroom home, it's just asking for trouble. 12 cars on the street sometimes. And um, I just would like to see the county um, do some kind of regulations or ordinances or c code of conduct for vacation rentals. Um, if you start doing research, South Shore, according to the Sierra Sun, has made some uh, code of conduct for rentals um, Glenshire's about to ban them because they consider um, them a business and they're rated, they're an R1, not um, rated for a business. I've talked to, uh, been working over at Kingswood Village. They've had a nightmare of a week where people were letting 18 people rent a three bedroom and um, last weekend they had to close the pool, it became so dangerous. And, and I'm sorry, you, your three minutes is up. Um, Thank you. I, I'm just, if, if you would, um, I think you've been given uh, some incorrect information I from so. Placer County staff, by Ca Placer County staff, and I apologize for that. What I'm going to ask is that you reach out to me. Um, we have staff locally here in Tahoe City um, who live in the basin as well, and we're all dealing with these same issues. Um, they will be able to give you correct information about what we are and aren't doing. It sounds like we probably need to reach out to Revenue Services as well to inform them about what we have and have not done. So if you wouldn't mind reaching out to me or to either of these two ladies right here in the front row, um, we can get some clarification for I you. I was thinking of also going to some advisory committee meetings. Perfect. And one of the homeowners in my neighborhood is making $60,000 a year off of her rentals and you guys aren't getting a penny uh, as far as the TOT. That, that may not be correct, so I'd like you to tie in with these two if you would. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time? Please come forward. Welcome. 
Hi, everybody. Hi, Placer County Board of Supervisors and Chair Montgomery. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come up here to Lake Tahoe. My name is JT Chevalier. I am the new incoming executive director for the Tahoe City Downtown Association. And just on the behalf of the Tahoe City Downtown Association, we'd like to welcome you all to the Lake Tahoe Basin and also invite you all to our concerts at Commons Beach. This is a weekly concert series goes on every Sunday at our Commons Beach facility, which is located in beautiful downtown Tahoe City, a fantastic event that sees over 2,000 plus attendees on a weekly basis and a great opportunity to see visitors and locals interact in a awesome and constructive way. So just wanted to send that invite out to you. We have Kun Ika, which is some great folk music this week, but would love to have you all out and uh, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, JT, and welcome. Good morning. I'm Ed Henneveld, 39-year resident of Squaw Valley. My comments today regard sighting of the proposed Squaw Valley Olympic Ski Museum in the Squaw Valley Park. Back in July 2015, four of you supervisors voted on this issue of should the park uh, be allowed or should the museum people be allowed to put a museum in the park. You voted three to one to quote, direct staff to assess the feasibility of locating a museum in the Squaw Valley Park. Inexplicably, and I contend prematurely, last February, you also approved $125,000 in public funds to advance this risky and bad idea. Wisely, some of your staff recognized the potential legal jeopardy because U.S. Forest Service deed restrictions that exist now that came with the sale of the land prohibit commercial operations in the park. On May 12th of this year, Ellie Alano, U.S. Forest Service, Tahoe National Forest Supervisor, put Placer County on notice as to this significant legal risk. He clearly warned that the museum in the park could, quote, violate the public interest and, quote, the United States could consider termination of the deed if the proposed museum and its operations meet the threshold of a development that is commercial in nature. Further, Supervisor Alano interviewed those Forest Service employees that were present historically back in the 1990s during this land transfer negotiation about what they thought was the original intent of that deed restriction. They told him the museum in the park was, quote, not consistent and would violate that intent. I was also there participating in those discussions and I completely agree that this park was built for recreation only, not for any commercial operation. Before any more public funds are spent on this museum in the park idea, I suggest you address this legal jeopardy warning by Supervisor Ilano. Although the museum proposal is still conceptual, their plans clearly call for significant commercial activity. The risk is not worth it. Do not award this $125,000 in TOT public funds that give this bad idea further momentum and continue to play into the hands of the park only museum proponents. They cannot even raise their own matching fund commitment, yet continue to seek public funds to advance their selfish location agenda. They are disingenuous when they claim the park is the only place it can be viable. Don't let them poach our park. First things first, answer the legal question challenged by the U.S. Forest Service and then decide how to proceed. Otherwise, this will be litigated. Do not risk the U.S. Forest Service reclaiming our park property. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Henneveld. Any other public comments? Yes, please come forward. Hi, I'm Marilyn Seawert, and I've been a plus 20 years uh, resident of Squaw Valley. And I would just like to give you another uh, aspect of what Dr. Hen Henneveld just said. I have had, especially since it's summer, a lot of conversation with other people in the community who really can't even believe that there would ever be a 15,000 square foot building in the middle of the park. So I think you have to, uh, we've only heard from the, the small group that wants to have the, the museum, and the museum's a fine idea. And there are many locations. I keep driving around and seeing other locations. But the community that, I, I mean, I talk to people all the time because I'm busy with all sorts of things. And they are aghast that a building like that would be put in our beautiful little park. And it is a little park. It isn't a huge, huge park. So anyway, I just thought you should keep in mind the other people 
besides the museum advocates, which is a small, concise group, uh, the public, I know, will have their chance to say something in the future, but uh, you should keep it in mind that not everybody is in favor of it. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Is there any other public comment at this time? All right, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, that will take us, I believe, to our first, let me make sure I haven't skipped anything, board member report and county executive reports. I did skip something. Any board member reports today? County executive? All right. I didn't skip anything in that case. All right, we're going to move to our 9-10 timed item. This is a community development resource agency item relating to the uh, memorandum of understanding between Placer County and the TRPA. Presenting today is Heather Beckman. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so as the presentation comes up, I'm an associate planner out of the Tahoe City office, and I've been with the county for about three years, but prior to that, I was with TRPA for about 10 years. So as you're aware, your board approved the Tahoe Basin Area Plan last December. And on January 25th, 2017, the TRPA Governing Board made the final approval for the area plan. As part of the area plan, there is a requirement that an MOU be implemented within six months, and so that's what before you, is before you today. And today is actually six months to the day from the approval. So the MOU does require approval by both your board as well as TRPA. So after today, we have three TRPA hearings to get to the final approval. And um, as such, TRPA has granted us a time extension until November 30th to get through all three of those hearings. So what is the MOU? What are the benefits to our customers? So we actually have an MOU. We've had an MOU with TRPA since 1995. And under that MOU, we primarily permit residential projects. So what does it do for us? or actually for our customers, and it gives one-stop permitting. So although our customers still need two permits, one from TRPA, one from the county, they can come to the, to the county, submit both permits, and we have a concurrent review. So there's a huge time savings there. This also prevents our customers from having to commute down to State Line Nevada to TRPA's offices. So that's an hour and a half drive, so a big savings there. We also, through the concurrent review, avoid the agency ping pong. So if we have separate reviews, so meaning no MOU in place, our customers may submit their permit to TRPA. TRPA may have a plan check correction that unknowingly does not conform to the county standards. So when we do a concurrent review, we make sure that all plan checks conform to both agencies. So there's a lot of time savings and savings in terms of frustration on the customer's behalf. Then in terms of building inspections, our building inspectors actually perform the TRPA inspections as well as our own. So again, another savings. So in the end, the bottom line for our customers is faster turnaround time on permits. We have no agency ping pong and fewer and faster inspections. So in the end, hopefully we're getting happier customers. So shown in this slide are two customers that actually came in last week. They're from Modesto. They purchased a home in Tahoe in 2016. They came in for a major remodel in addition. So they submitted both their permits to us. Had we not had the MOU in place, they would have then made the one and a half hour drive down to TRPA to do the same permit submittal process. So there was a huge time savings, but they were also pleased with the ease of the process. So it can be very challenging for an applicant to try and parallel track separate permitting reviews. So there was a huge, um, and that can be very overwhelming and daunting, so that was a huge, huge bonus to these customers as well. So now I want to talk about our approach to the MOU. Um, in the next two slides, I'll actually talk about the MOU activities themselves, but our approach that we are presenting to you today is that we expand our MOU to contain the full suite of activities that can be delegated to a local jurisdiction. So we're greatly expanding what we can do. But with that in mind, we are proposing a metered or step-by-step -step approach to assuming responsibility for these activities. Rather than assume them all at once, we want to do it over time. And the rationale for this step-by-step -step approach is based on our county staffing. So we want to make sure we have enough staff to address customer inquiries and issue permits and have a successful implementation. It's also based on training. Um, so with this expanded MOU, we would be entering into sections of TRPA's regulations that our staff is 
really only touched the, touched the surface on up until this point. And so there is a high level of expertise that we would need to gain. And then finally, it has to do also with our hearing bodies. Um, when and if we expand our MOU activities to discretionary permits, so say minor use or conditional use permits, our hearing bodies from zoning administrator to planning commission and to even your board would become the TRPA decision makers. So in other words, our hearing bodies would have to ensure that TRPA's environmental review is completed, make TRPA's findings, as well as the project approval, um, whether it be approving, conditioning, or denying a project. So not only do our staff have to be experts, but so do our hearing bodies. We have built into the MOU language um, a way to actually Im implement this metered approach. So we do not, as the county, officially assume responsibility for an MOU activity until training has been completed and until we um, indicate in writing the exact date that we will assume responsibility for the MOU. So that means we do not have to assume responsibility for all of these activities immediately or ever if we choose. So with that, I'd like to get into um, the actual MOU activities. So as I said, we have a current MOU since 1995. Under that, we um, conduct TRPA residential verifications, single family permitting, residential qualified exempt permitting, multifamily projects up to four units and signs. And we propose to continue that without interruption. Then within the first year, we propose to take our first step in expansion. And so that would include TRPA verifications of the commercial tourist mixed use projects, um, qualified exempt permitting for those same categories of projects, as well as the permitting of non-permanent structures, so tough sheds, greenhouses, and that would be um, utilizing TRPA's coverage exemption rules. So all of the activities listed on this slide, um, we have researched. So we looked at the last four years of TRPA's permitting history, got the number of applications that would be associated with this slide, and then projected the number of staff hours. So based on our current staffing, as well as some recent additions to staff that we have, we feel that we can um, take on this extra work and still successfully implement the MOU. And I would like to point out that with those commercial projects that we propose to expand to, that again, based on TRPA's history of permitting, that would be about 30 verifications a year and about 40 qualified exempt permits a year. So this expansion would actually touch a lot of customers and a lot of projects in terms of this streamlined one-stop one permitting. So then, in terms of the longer term MOU activities, that gets us into the small, medium, large, commercial, tourist, mixed use projects. So this gets us into the discretionary permits I just spoke of. Um, these types of projects, based on TRPA's permit history, we see about three to five of them a year. Um, no two are, as, are alike. They are all very unique and have their own complex, complex, complexities to them. So recent projects might be Domus, Voltaics, Speckled Gardens, Base Camp Lodge. Um, given that these projects tend to be more complex and that they're discretionary, so we'd have to have TRPA findings and approvals made by our, our hearing bodies, we are proposing that we assume these activities over time as our staffing and expertise allows. So also as part of today, um, we're proposing the adoption of a TRPA Placer County filing fee schedule. So again, staff, we analyze TRPA's base application fees versus the number of applications and projected hours it will take us to not only process the permits, but also to respond to customers' inquiries. So um, if retaining 100% of TRPA's base application fee, we feel that that will cover our staff time. We're also recommending a consumer price index annual adjustment to that fee schedule. And then finally, staff will be monitoring the fees we're taking in um, from our applications as well as the time we're expending on them. And if we determine that there's a def deficit in that, we will be returning to your board to ask for a fee schedule adjustment. So what are the next steps? So today, step one is um, the hearing before your board. And if your board does approve and adopt the MOU, as I mentioned, we then have three TR TRPA hearings. The first two hearings are recommending bodies. The final would be approvable by TRPA governing board. And we are targeting the September 27th hearing for that. 
So with that, um, staff is asking um, your approval on two uh, items today. First is to adopt a resolution to approve the MOU, as well as to authorize the CEDR director to actually implement the MOU. And finally would be adoption of the Placer County TRPA project filing fee schedule. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I also have Teresa Avance here from TRPA. She's my counterpart processing this MOU, and so she can also answer questions as well. Heather, thank you. Um, just for the audience, this is a public hearing. I'll, before I open the public hearing, I'm going to come to the board and see if there are any clarifying questions. Um, uh, once we've dealt with those, if there are any, we'll open the public hearing, and the public will be able to comment on this item. Are there any questions or concerns from any board member about this item? I see lots of heads shaking in the negative, so um, I'm going to open the public hearing. This is the opportunity for any member of the public to come forward on this item and make any comments, um, ask any questions, raise any concerns, give us your insight. Going, going, gone. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Easiest public hearing we've ever held, I believe. Um, I'm going to bring this back to the board. Uh, any questions or comments before we take action? All right. Uh, just, <clears throat> just quickly, just to comment that um, this is a, a, a very positive step forward. I'm, I'm glad that we're moving in this direction. Uh, clearly, uh, much better customer service than having to bounce back and forth between the two agencies. Uh, it would be over time, nice to see how much of this we can consolidate into one location um, and also be looking at where, um, where there might be opportunities to even reduce the, the, the number of times that uh, both agencies get drawn into a permit at all. Uh, if we reach a, a point where we are comfortable that Placer County is addressing the concerns that TRPA was established to address, then do we really need two separate permits, two separate fees, all of that, or can one agency, one fee, one permit cover both uh, and, and kind of check the box that way? But this is uh, at least a step in the right direction. That. Thank you for your comments, Supervisor Euler. Any other comments? All right, what's the pleasure of the, oh, uh, the clerk? The clerk has presented uh, corrected right. copies of the resolutions for the board members today. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Second. We have a motion, Euler. I'm gonna give the second to Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move to our 920 timed item. This is a uh, county executive item. This is the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association transitional contract. Uh, Jennifer Merchant and Aaron Casey will be presenting today's item. Welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair. Is this back off again? No, it's back on. It's you on? Just, you can, yeah. oh, there it goes. Uh, Jennifer Merchant, for the record, uh, here presenting on behalf of the County Executive Office, a proposed six-month contract with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association. As you referenced, Aaron and I are gonna tag team this. I'll take the first five slides, and then Aaron will wrap it up, and we'll push it on to some public comment that okay. I suspect will occur. And I'm gonna mention for the public, there are some seats that have just freed up um, after the last agenda item, if anyone would like to sit or not. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, so I'm going to cover it, uh, the outline of the presentation. Uh, the, the first few of these bullet points here will seem familiar to those of you who heard the, uh, a portion of this presentation in June. Um, we felt it was important to kind of reiterate some of the points that we had discussed with your board back in June because we've got a, a slightly different and, and broader audience here today. So um, we will be uh, reviewing the contract negotiations that have occurred to date with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association and going over public outreach that uh, both entities have undertaken over the last several months as well as uh, going over the feedback that we've received. Based on those outreach efforts, we will be discussing with you the mediated agreement that we came to back in June with the Resort Association's Executive Committee, 
uh, discussing what some of the contract objectives that came out of that mediation are and how those feed into the, the actual six-month contract that's before your board today and then requesting uh, board action on that transitional contract with the resort association. So I'm going to, to review where we've been on the, the contract on April 1st as required in our contract. We did submit a uh, budget and a requested scope of work term uh, to the resort association and we made some suggestions for a revised scope of work to really focus on marketing and less so on transportation and capital projects. On May 3rd within the uh, contract uh, allowed deadlines, the resort association did respond with a counter proposal saying that they did suggest and prefer that the um, scope of work looked very similar to the scope of work that we have engaged in with the organization for the past 20 years. And in the months of May and June, uh, we met with the executive committee to uh, discuss the, uh, the two different proposals and on June 23rd held a mediated session uh, with the executive committee or three members of the executive committee and on the the county end uh, was Aaron Casey and myself and David Bosch who participated in that mediated session. During that time we also did have your board acted early in June to do a 31 day contract extension to allow for that mediation to occur because we thought that, that we could make much more progress during that period of time which we um, were happily able to do. On June 27th uh, then your your board did uh, approve that interim contract and here we are today on July 25th with a six month contract proposal. So um, after the, the submittal from Placer County staff regarding the uh, budget and requested changes to the scope of work, the, the county staff as well as the North Lake Tower Resort Association engaged in a variety of meetings uh, both small group meetings and larger town halls and open house type meetings. Uh, county staff specifically engaged with the business associations presented to the MACs as well as the Truckee North Tahoe Transportation Management Association regarding the proposed changes. Uh, after the your board's action on the one month interim contract and the successful mediation, we did issue a joint press release about the terms that we agreed to during the mediation session. And um, on July 24th, there was a joint community meeting held uh, with the resort association and some members of the, the community who were concerned about the direction the contract may be moving. The feedback that we had received to date that really led us to uh, some of the terms of the mediation uh, were that it was very important to preserve it, the community voice regarding the expenditures of TOT funds in relation to marketing, but also into transportation and capital project expenditures. The community really wanted us to slow down the process of proposed changes so that they could understand what the changes were, if they uh, would or would not support them, and how they may be able to participate in any change process. Uh, we also heard that they wanted to have more participation from a broader cross-section of the community in eastern Placer County where the TOT funds are collected. And they suggested that the, the, the funds get allocated, that additional funds get allocated to capital projects in addition to what we may be able to allocate today. They wanted to ensure that there is transparency and accountability by the county or any other organization touching the money because it is public money. And they did want us to maintain a partnership uh, in some form with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association as a representative of the business community, as well as continue public outreach on our progress with the, the contract negotiation and the uh, priorities within the Tourism Master Plan, which is really the guiding document for the organization and was approved by your board back in October 2015. So I'm going to bring Aaron up to talk about the mediation and the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Good morning, Aaron Casey with the County Executive Office. So I'll take it from here. So I'm going to talk a bit about the mediation agreement. And you'll notice that a lot of the shared goals and interests that I'm going to cover here are rooted in the community feedback that Jennifer just uh, highlighted for your board. 
So first, geogra diverse geographic representation. So ensuring that all communities in Eastern Placer County are represented or that those voices are also participating and being heard as it relates to priorities that are being established for communities in Eastern Placer County. Transparency and accountability. So this refers to the relationship between the county and the resort association as well as both organizations and the community at large improve and build community partnerships, and then, as Jennifer just mentioned, identify efficiencies and allocate additional TOT to capital projects where we're able to do this. So these were shared goals and interests that were identified through our mediation process and were foundational to the discussions that took place later in the day that helped us really develop our agreement. So what did we agree to? What were the next steps? And some of those were, were actually exercising today. So the first one there is the six month transitional contract which really will allow us to work together and engage the community to continue to hear what their thoughts are on our partnership as we move forward into the future. We wanna to develop together with the resort association and then implement a community outreach plan. So we wanna continue the work that we were doing the last few months, participating in, in standing meetings that are held in the community as well as perhaps convene additional meetings ourselves around the tourism master plan priorities and the partnership between Placer County and the Resort Association. So we're actually developing that as we speak. A second facilitated meeting is also something we've discussed. We haven't confirmed that yet, but something we talked about as a possibility that was a very successful process for us and led to the six month contract you see today as well as these agreed upon next steps. And so if that is something that we feel is needed or could be helpful in our process, that's something we may engage in in the future. The Resort Association has undergone a very significant and robust review process of the organization over the past 18 months, and so this is the fourth bullet here. They'd like the opportunity to take some of the recommended changes and or considerations from subcommittees that were convened around things like the Chamber of Commerce or Board Governance and also the Marketing Committee, and really determine where they can implement some of these uh, changes or recommendations from these subcommittees, and we'll take advantage of the six month period to do that. And then from there, really working together to develop a long term scope of work and contract that we would bring before your board, hopefully in December of this year. So what are the six month contract objectives? The first is an ongoing marketing services, so I'll go over that in more detail, but you'll notice that the marketing services that are identified in the contract are consistent with services provided by the organization on behalf of the community for several years. But what's a bit unique here is the development of a marketing plan, and so there have been forms of this over the years created by the organization, but the organization would like to take some of the recommendations from the marketing subcommittee I just referenced and work to really develop a long-term plan that would also incorporate performance indicators, um, which is the third bullet point there, a review of the current performance indicators and determine if there need to be changes to those. And that would be consistent with the priority-based budgeting that your board heard about in the June board meeting, as well as ensure accountability and transparency, and then look at industry best practices. Some of these performance indicators were developed a fair amount of time ago, and so it's time to really review those and determine are they the best way to determine the return on investment and understand whether or not the work is is really yielding the results that the community is expecting. Streamline participation in transportation planning. So we've talked a bit about how we might engage with other organizations in the community, including the Transportation Management Association as an example, to really help define transportation, uh, the transportation vision, and then provide guidance as it relates to expanding transportation services in Eastern Placer County. Review the tourism master plan implementation. So your board approved the most recent iteration of this plan in October of 2015. And so we see an opportunity to really take a look at this and say, okay, what progress have we made in two years? And what more do we wanna to try to accomplish in this plan over the next several years? And are there adjustments that need to be made in terms of the strategy to get this done? Develop a capital projects partnership. So this is uh, gives us an opportunity to really look at how have we been 
engaging the community and identifying priorities around the tourism master plan, and in particular related to capital projects, and then determine what is the best way to continue that process of community engagement, developing those priorities, and then making recommendations to your board on where we might invest TOT funds to support those initiatives. And then at the bottom, of course, engage the community. So this is, there are some details here on what the six month transitional contract includes. So the contract total up at the top there for six months is $1,779,495. This contract term is August 1st, 2017 through January 31st of 2018. And it includes the following services. So there on the marketing side, you'll see that the contract total there is $1,728,262. And this includes direct marketing program, visitor information services, conference sales, as well as special event sponsorships. On the transportation side, the total amount for that department is $18,104. And this is to continue supporting regional transportation initiatives. There are robust programs happening in the community and the resort association will continue to participate in those programs and lend their support as well as their vision to that process. Infrastructure services there at the bottom, $33,129. This is again to work with Placer County and the community here in Eastern Placer County to develop capital projects partnership, and then finally to continue engaging the community here as well. And with that, Jennifer and I are here and happy to answer any questions your board may have. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'll start here with the board, Supervisor Duran. Yeah, um, I'll just say I'm, I'm very grateful that, uh, that the two sides came together to s resolve or explore their differences and to determine what things that they could build on, what uh, each um, uh, party's strength and uh, weakness is. Um, you know, the, the, anytime you, you, f you forward a problem and ask us to, to try to do something, uh, and make a decision on your behalf, um, there's a risk there. And I think that uh, that risk is whether or not any of us really want the brain damage. So I'm really thankful that when parties get together and chart their own course, um, that that is really the best of both worlds because when you guys do it yourselves, you can create a win-win. Unfortunately, when you give it to the board, it creates sometimes uh, winners and losers. So I'm thankful. I'm supportive of what you're trying to do, um, and I wish you success. Supervisor Holmes. I, too, want to thank you. Uh, I know your uh, staff has done a lot of work on this the last 18 months, uh, and I appreciate you keeping me abreast of what's going on. Um, I think it's a, it's a good approach, uh, again, to engage more of the community in the process, and uh, I'm happy to support it. So I just want to thank you and the, all of those that participated in the outreach. Supervisor Wigand? Yeah, just one uh, specific question. On the, on the last bullet, is it related to the infrastructure and the outreach? There's been a lot of discussion, I guess I should premise this, by, about um, um, community input as to the expenditures of all of these funds. On the capital component, it talked about engaging with the North Lake Tower Resort Association regarding uh, outreach and gaining community uh, input so strategically could you just fill in for me a little bit more about how staff is intending to do that in conjunction with the resort association and how I'm, I'm assuming and I'm looking forward to having a broader outreach and more input but could you give me a little more detail about the roles each is going to play in that regard yeah. is this on? sorry it's on yes <laughs> So, Supervisor Wygant, we have been in the process of developing a schedule with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association to identify, one, over the next six months, how will we engage the community participating in standing meetings, so municipal advisory councils, business association meetings, among many others, but then also working to develop a plan around convening the community, perhaps at meetings we might uh, develop ourselves and so that's something that's currently underway to really define how we would move forward around capital projects and that partnership what that might look like and really start with the tourism master plan is really the defining platform for that so 
again, I think that's where the analysis of where have we, what have we accomplished over the last two years will be helpful to us in really looking at that, what investments have been made, what's outstanding, and then what's the best way to proceed there in terms of accomplishing as much as we can over the next few years. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Eudler. Um, okay. All right, um, seeing no other comments from the board, I'll now open this up to the public for any public comment. If there's anyone who would like to come forward and public, on, public and comment on this item, now is the time for the public to do so. Please come forward, identify yourself if you'd like to comment on this. Warning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman Montgomery and the supervisors. Uh, first of all, I want to thank... I'm sorry, would you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Adam Wilson, the current chair of the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association. So first of all, I want to also thank uh, the county and your time as we've gone through this process. It has been challenging, for sure, and there's been a lot of community input, both on both sides, and we've really worked hard to get to a point where, in fact, we can move forward in a very productive and efficient manner on behalf of our community. I was a little disappointed today, uh, this morning actually, when I read the staff report that this presentation absolutely reflects the direction that we're going, but when I read the staff report this morning, there was the whole county proposal, and part of the mediation that we took place in was not to talk about their plan versus our plan, and to see that in the staff report this morning was a little disappointing. Uh, that the whole county plan was outlined in the staff report. But I'm hopeful and still very optimistic that based on the presentation that was given, that we're moving in the right direction, further mediation and more partnership and more community input will get us to a point that will be good, not only on behalf of your organization and our organization, but most importantly, on behalf of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Any other public comments on this? Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Um, uh, before I take it back to Supervisor Euler, I do just want to mention staff reports um, are intended to give a comprehensive overview of the history of any item that comes in front of us. And so while I understand that there may be some discomfort around um, uh, the, the, the specific language that was in the staff report, it's not intended to be an, a slight to anyone or to cause any offense. It's really intended just to educate and bring people up to speed on where we have been, how we got to where we are, and where we are today. So, Supervisor Euler. I <clears throat> want to preface my, my comments in the context of uh, the reminder that I got from Ron McIntyre yesterday that back in 1995 when we were talking about putting this relationship together, uh, I was quite the skeptic. Uh, at the time. I, I was not, I don't know if Robert remembers that, but I was not fully on board with the idea. And what uh, has occurred over the last 22 years in terms of the engagement by the business community to really assist with driving forward uh, broader public policy that has resulted in projects in the ground has been amazing. And I have no doubt that absent the active engagement of our business community, specifically uh, those folks that uh, through their investment in their private capital are responsible for the generation of the uh, transient occupancy tax that we enjoy uh, putting into these projects, we would not be where we are with the number of public amenities that we have, with the amount of transportation, uh, that we're able to provide through our transit services and all the rest. And so as we move forward, I am very hopeful that we will uh, pay very close attention, continue to pay very close attention to the voice of the business community that has actively engaged in making sure through the course of years and several elections, making sure that we are uh, in a position to continue to fund these kinds of projects by virtue of what we collect through our TOT, what they have supported uh, in, in going to the voters and asking for uh, 
the continuation of, of this tax and the expansion of it. Um, without that, with if, if at any time the resort association folks, the people that comprise that group, feel that they are being separated from this process of investing those dollars into the needed infrastructure that helps to drive that mission forward, I think we will see a dramatic decrease in um, our effectiveness in delivering projects up here in Tahoe. And so I want to make sure that from a staff standpoint, we are uh, very finely attuned to what that voice is telling us, that, that business voice is telling us in terms of our investments meeting their needs. It's worked well so far. Um, I know that there have been some concerns about how public dollars, I don't want to say have been spent, but may, maybe more uh, how some of the accounting has, has been managed in the past in terms of this relationship. And while I get that, um, I would also look at it from the standpoint of you know, when, when we contracted with Tiger to do the Auburn Folsom widening and we gave them tens of millions of dollars to get it done, we, didn't, we then didn't take the next step of crawling around inside of their books to see how they were spending the money. We just said, go build the road and get it done and get the job done. And, and, and hopefully, as we move forward, we're looking at this partnership with the Resort Association more broadly from that perspective. Is the job getting done? Are, is the resort association performing um, overall the role that, that our board originally envisioned in 95, 96, and where we are today? But it will only happen if we continue um, to build, perhaps sometimes rebuild, uh, the trust between us, the county, and the business associations so that they understand that, that we do have their interests in mind in this process. Thank you, Supervisor Yeller. Any other board comments? Okay, seeing none, um, I would like to take the opportunity to say that I actually agree with Supervisor Yeller. Um, and I think the really good news around the six month proposal is that it actually does address those particular issues and that the, the, both the resort association as an entity and the business associations as more of an, amor an amorphous but uh, clearly important part of Eastern Placer County are going to be included in this process. Um, the, the intent behind the, the process moving forward is to expand that. And, and I think why that is important and why I call this out particularly is because the world is changing around us. As we heard from the individual uh, who spoke under public comment this morning, we are seeing more and more TOT raised through private homeowners. Uh, who are renting their homes out. And so while in the past the business association has been the primary generator of TOT, that may be changing, which means we may need to change our conversation around the uses of TOT and expand it beyond the, the footprint it has had in the past. But I, but I agree uh, that the business community is identified as that sort of pa at least past primary uh, funder of TOT through through their operations absolutely needs to remain part of this process and my intention certainly is that they will and my guess is all five of us on the board want us want to see that as well so thank you very much for your comments um, any other comments before I take it to the board okay seeing none what's the pleasure of the board all right we have a motion and a second with the caveat I know that we talked about the TOT issue Jack is your mic on um, I know we've talked about the TOT issue ad nauseum, but just to inform the public out there, there's anywhere estimated anywhere from one to three million in unrecovered TOT that could be uh, of a very important uh, to launching these projects. And I would hope that any plan you bring back is going to be uh, a priority in, in recovering that. So thank you. And um, on that note, Supervisor Duran, I think it's important uh, 
just to take 10 seconds and give a quick update, which is I believe that um, code compliance has sent out to about 20% of the folks identified as non-compliant, and we've received almost half a million dollars in revenue generated from, from that 20%. Good. So, yeah. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank motion you. Carries. We'll see you in six months. Well, before. <laughs> All right. So we are now going to move to our 9.40 a.m. timed item. This is a public works and facilities item relating to the former Station 51, otherwise known as the old Tahoe City Firehouse, um, and updates on uh, that parcel and the properties on the parcel. Welcome. Good morning. And you have to, there you go, push the button. Ah, there we go. Um, good morning. I'm Mark Rideout with Public Works and Facilities. I am here with Susie Vos and Shauna Doherty this morning to talk to you about the fire station, um, probably a property you're all very familiar with. Um, today we're going to provide an update on the outreach that we've uh, been undertaking, and indeed it's continuing since we've uh, prepared this report a couple weeks ago. Um, we're going to ask your board to give us direction to initiate a request for information process reaching out to the community and then receive some guidance from me perhaps on evaluation criteria um, to help us judge what we do receive back. Um, so you're likely familiar, as I said, with the western portion of Commons Beach. Um, it's improved with the former fire station 51 and the Tahoe Community Center. Um, as this slide shows, it is central to the community and in some ways forms both the gateway to the lake and the community. The property is improved with the fire station, which is a two-story concrete block building that the county received through a quick claim from the fire district in 2013. Uh, the community center building next to it, they don't quite touch, we're not absolutely sure, but um, the, TCPD, the TCPUD currently manages that, and we're discussing a similar quick claim process with them to clear up the title ambiguities that we've uh, evaluated over the years. Back in 20. Back in 2013, when we received the quick claim for the fire district, your board directed staff to evaluate the buildings. Um, we found that despite their modest size, um, 5,000 square feet for the fire station, 2,600 square feet for the community center, it would be very costly to improve them and bring them up to present standards. Um, indeed, the preliminary costs that we found for ADA building systems, the electrical, the HVAC, and an elevator, it's about 800,000 for the fire station, about 500,000 for the community center, and somewhat less for the visitor center. So it's a sizable investment to bring it completely up to code. And going through the conversations with the community, you know, there are a variety of levels of use, and those are just some guidepost numbers that I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, one of the things that we really looked at was the wide variety of planning documents that the communities considered and that can inform the future use of this property to the benefit of everybody involved. And the goal was really to respect these past efforts and try to not ask the community the same questions over and over again. Um, one of the pieces of data that we analyzed was the um, permissible, you know, what, what's allowed under the new community plan. Um, there, there are a lot of things that can be done there. And um, I guess the way the slide is, is arranged, it's cutting off the not allowed at the bottom, which we found that hotels, hostels, and professional offices are not allowed in these zoning districts. But with a minor use permit or a conditional use pit, there, there are a wide variety of um, activities that could occur in these buildings or on this piece of property. Um, and, and just to kind of remind everybody, and I didn't have a slide specifically for it, but the Commons Beach parcel extends all the way to the east to the Watson cabin. So the um, buildings are attached to that. So these are the uses that are allowed on that um, recreational zone district. Um, we, we talked amongst staff, we reviewed planning documents in the community, and there are some fairly obvious constraints um, and opportunities. Um, looking at the uh, parking that exists nearby, but it's not immediately adjacent to the site, the cost that I mentioned, um, the economical conditions, um, both for a developer to come in and, and what could be um, uh, realized by a venture in the site. Um, and really what 
sort of spurred our coming today was several contacts we received last fall. Um, we were talking to some restaurateurs and other folks that expressed interest in the property, and we thought, you know, it's probably time to start the conversation with the community again. Um, we engaged Shauna Doherty's company, Fresh Tracks, to facilitate outreach to the community and shape a discussion that could inform good decisions about the community. And so we had um, a, steering a steering committee form, which was really just folks that were interested. We reached out to community leaders and county staff to sort of design what this outreach process might be. Um, Fresh Tracks then proceeded to speak to 20, 25 people in the community that are identified as business leaders and leaders of agencies and other um, entities around the lake to kind of see what their vision and thoughts are, what could most benefit the um, community. We conducted two community workshops in the space. Um, the June 5th workshop was designed to have folks come before the flush of tourists. That was a week, weeknight evening, I believe, um, when 30, 40 people came and talked to us and, and had a broad conversation about their vision. Um, then on July 1st, a Saturday, we had the doors rolled up and an easel out on the apron talking to people as they walked by to see what their thoughts were. Um, and Susie will kind of go through some of that in a couple minutes here. But one of the things that we started talking about early on with the steering committee was what are the guiding principles? And we just brainstormed um, really what could benefit Tahoe City and, and help revitalize it as we've talked about the challenges for the economic condition, the housing condition, all the things that have been talked about over time. And really it's about bringing people together and improving the economic condition in Tahoe City. Are there scenic or water quality benefits that could accrue you know, through this project? Um, and then it has to be feasible. We have to look at a time frame and a cost that makes sense to everybody involved. We're looking for it to be financially sustainable. We, we want to have a partner or, or, or some project um, that, that can run itself. Um, again, linking to planning documents. And then we talk broadly about thinking out of the box and being innovative to enhance this sense of community. Um, indeed, one of the things when we ran a process a few years back looking at the um, interpretive center for this site, it was the idea of kind of a public place that people can come together on a snowy day and, and, and share each other's company. Um, so as I said, we, we conducted two public workshops um, and I guess this is the point. I'm going to turn it over to Susie. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Not quite orchestrated. As I said, this is an evolving process. Good morning, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Susie Vos, and I'm a senior project manager with uh, the Property Management Division. So some of the feedback that we've gotten so far includes a huge need for Tahoe City to have a gathering space. Um, it needs venues for creative outlets. Um, and there's a need to reactivate this property to help bring vibrancy to Tahoe City. And it's a unique central location that could draw people in to connect. Um, we need to prevent those in Truckee and the different resort areas from eating our lunch in <laughs> Tahoe City. <laughs> need indoor activities for rainy days, like Mark mentioned, and uh, the need for youth space. And there was, um, oh yes, thank you Mark. Um, so for, we talked about some mixed use concepts and um, some of the things were create a reason for the visitors from Truckee and the resorts to come to Tahoe City. We need to serve all ages, all times of the day, all seasons, um, connect to Commons Beach and have a gathering place for community events, um, serve locals and visitors. And then some design ideas that came up were um, have flexible space, indoor, outdoor, movable walls, movable seating. Um, some wanted to create a plaza by demolishing the fire station and rehabbing the community center building adjacent to it. Um, support live, learn, work, play activities. And then include information about um, cultural heritage and conservation ideas for the lake. Um, and then finally view um, both buildings as a whole. And just meaning you could you know, new ideas for the fire station could be the fire station comes down and, and that's maybe a plaza and there's something with community center or vice versa, or both buildings come down and a new, one new building comes up to replace them. So there was a lot of art use ideas and um, talking about a multi-use cultural art center, things that could occur there would be dance, theater, music, gallery, 
weddings, speaker series, kids workshops, interactive art, not just static galleries is something we heard a couple times from um, the community. And then a showcase for local public art, indoor artist and residency program, and an outdoor sculpture garden. And then interim uses for the firehouse for maybe something like free art Saturdays and kids art summer camp. And then um, to look at the model for the artist work and live space, that is artspace.org. And then we had some, some other comments, kind of just miscellaneous, um, was sell Tahoe made crafts and food and highlight the local food and culture create plaza for food trucks, um, open up the views to the lake and to Commons Beach, um, provide a teen center, build a brand new multi-use complex, um, provide a climbing wall and uh, climbing wall gym and juice bar. And then I'm gonna turn it back over to Mark. Yeah, and actually what I'd like to do is ask Actually, what I'd like to do is ask Shauna to come up and give some more sense of the outreach and the people that she talked to one-on-one -on -one through the community process. Good morning, Shauna Doherty, Fresh Tracks Communications. I'm a Trekkie-based public outreach and communications firm, um, and I've been working on this project for about the past four months, talking to people. My phone number has been up on the banner on the firehouse for the last four months, and I only got phone calls this weekend. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. I always um, put my name and and email on um, outreach materials, and I'm always surprised that more people don't call. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is a little bit about the design of our process and uh, where we're at today. Um, Mark mentioned that before we started talking to the community in forums, um, we went out and talked to, had one-on-one -on -one phone conversations or um, in-person conversations with about 20 or 25 people. And in that, we also talked to some developers and asked them, um, you know, what would make this, at the end of this process, something that you would be interested in potentially um, putting forward a proposal and what kind of information do you need and what would that look like? And um, that, that really fed into the, our overall design of this process because um, we wanted to end up with a really good set of feedback based on where we're at today. There's been um, lots and lots of conversations about this piece of property and um, we really wanted to have real time uh, input based on the various factors that are happening today to provide that information to um, a developer or a team that was excited about doing something that would inform their um, proposal but not be prescriptive. And so some of the feedback that we got was, you know, why are we not ending up today with an exact sort of, we are going to do X, Y, or Z. And the reason is, is that um, we really wanted to collect that feedback and then have somebody who could bring forward um, a proposal based on the criteria and the community feedback, what they think would be feasible in that space and not be prescriptive. Um, a few other things that I wanted to highlight is that um, we did invite the uh, principal of the Tahoe City, um, the North Tahoe High School to get some students involved, so that's um, was exciting for us to have them in, involved in the conversation um, from the youth perspective. Um, and then also just in general, um, there really wasn't a hundred percent, there wasn't, when we went into the process, we thought there would be sort of um, a general temperature of what people wanted to see in that space. Um, I think Mark touched on, Susie and Mark touched on that in general, um, people wanted to be a gathering place. There was a lot of um, conversation about arts, and then there was definitely a leaning towards taking down the firehouse. So if we had to come up with themes, um, but again, a lot of those conversations were the same people submitting comments, um, coming to multiple meetings, submitting comments um, via Facebook, um, emailing, and then calling me with their comments. Um, we had about 200 comments in total and about 150 people that participated in those various forums. So. Um, not comprehensive, but enough to give us a feel of where people were at with that building. Um, I think the other thing I want to stress is that people really feel like this is an incredible opportunity. It's a really unique spot, and that um, it's 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 a very they're very excited. So I just wanted to make sure that that came through. That people were 
um, in general, very excited and very, very adamant, 100% adamant that we didn't walk away with a nothing, that it's status quo. So I just wanted to make that clear. Shauna, could you, just in case um, anybody missed it, could you touch on the three sort of points of general consensus you think you did hear arise out of the conversation? Yeah, so the, um, so the, what I just said before. Yeah. yeah, so the main, what I, when I was, I, re, I went through all the comments again before today, just to re, we, every time someone emailed us or called um, or submitted a comment at the meeting, we just have a running spreadsheet and I really looked at those and, um, as you know, with uh, community outreach in that way, it is not a science. Um, so the themes that emerged were um, do something, do not leave as status, don't, do, don't leave as is. Um, take down, the majority of people felt that the firehouse should come down. Um, the third one is art, some kind of gathering, multi-use gathering space that could include arts, but also other uses so that it ended up being financially viable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, okay, and one more thing is just, um, cause I, is just back to the uh, linking with the plan. So making sure that, um, you know, we're talking about the tourism master plan and we're talking about the mobility plan. Let's make sure that this project enhances those efforts happening. Great, thank you. And, and so just to close here, um, one of the other groups that we heard from were the Tahoe Marina Lodge folks. They were very involved and offered comments into the process. And what we'd like to do is talk with you folks a bit today about sort of the criteria that we might take forward through the RFI process. And one of the bits of work staff's going to be um, undertaking here in the next while is really winnowing down and distilling what we've heard. Um, you know, there are needs in the community that we want to highlight. There are design concepts. There are um, economic driver concepts. And so when we put a package together out to the community, um, we really want to um, have something, and also talking to some of the folks, really to have a lot of the background available so people can really digest it and, and come forward with a good proposal. Um, so w some of the things we talked about was, you know, people are always asking, well, what would the county be willing to invest? And, and I said, well, I don't know. We need to see what the proposal might be. And so we would be looking as one of the criteria for a proposer to describe, you know, how they would leverage one-time monies that we might give to the project. Looking at the ep economic return and also those intangible uh, returns to the community, and that it would be flexible, that, that it could be used for a variety of opportunities. And, and then really to respect the community's vision. A lot of the things that we've talked about um, and have come back up through the different planning documents that we've heard again today. But, um, you know, does it need to be public meeting space? Does it need to be a plaza? Does it need to be a, a for-profit uh, venture? It'll be interesting to see over the next period of time. So um, this has been a really quick process, and so I'm not quite as prepared as I'd like to be. I'd like to have criteria to provide to you to say yes or no, but um, if we can have your input, um, ideally we'd be back, be back to your board in October with that first flush of what we've heard back from the community and then get an additional direction from your board. So do, does any of this, the guiding principles or, or the evaluation criteria resonate with you? So let me um, start by just asking members of the board if they have any questions or clarifications and I think we'll tease your Super. question out of that. Supervisor Euler. Supervisor Wigand. Supervisor Holmes. Nope. Supervisor Duran. I don't have any questions, but as a as a guideline, you know, I, I would think that you might want to use some of the principles that you used to outreach for the fairgrounds. You know, we, you know, we had a you had pretty good success at, at using some of those mm -hmm. criteria. You might want to incorporate some of those into what you want to do here. Super, thanks. Okay, seeing no other questions or comments from the board, I'll open this up to the public. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment, ask questions, give input? JT, please come forward. Hello all, JT uh, Chevalier from the Tau City Downtown Association. And uh, our membership organization, we see over 270 different members and business organizations in Tahoe City, and uh, sent the great information that both Susie and Shauna have provided for us over the course of this process. And just wanted to provide a little feedback that we've heard back from our members of the organization. And their hope is just that during the RFP and the RF I, that we just take the appropriate time to make sure that we suss out all the opportunities um, and then also look into other regions that have had a similar success in, you know, 
making sure that this development is something that fits within the ideas of the Tahoe City community. So um, that was just their only piece of feedback, but uh, once again, really appreciate the time that both Susie and Sean have taken to reach out to the community. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or input on this item? <laughs> no fighting. <laughs> hey. I'm Mia Hanek, the Executive Director of Tahoe Public Art. And um, I just wanted to read a, a quote and comment that uh, I think is important for the foundation of what the uh, land was originally intended for. So it says, the site where these three structures were built was given to the people of Tahoe City by Ulysses S. Grant in 1872. The community center was built in 1930 and the fire station in 1961. And then <laughs> it says, um, from Ulysses S. Grant to Mark Twain, this place did not suffer from a lack of swanky clientele. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the opportunity with this place as the gateway to Tahoe City and the lake, lake-wide communities is um, it's a place where we could bring creative minds together to be inspired by the lake and talk about art, uh, environment, and other activities and solution for all ages at all day and night around the clock. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, um, Madam Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I'm Carol White, um, resident of Tahoe City at Tahoe Marina Lakefront. We just changed our name from Tahoe Marina Lodge to avoid confusion with Tahoe City Lodge across the street that was recently approved. I want to bring to the Board's attention that there were almost 100 written comments from residents of Tahoe Marina Lodge where there are 48 residential units many of which are owned by extended families. That's why there are more than 48 comments. These comments were almost unanimously, uh, they almost were unanimously preferred tearing down the fire station, the firehouse, and replacing it with something else. But this does not necessarily mean that they were all opposed to development on the site. Um, in fact, some liked a park, some liked a building and a park, and some mixed use over the entire uh, whole site. So we're not opposed to any of these ideas that are out there and we're open to interesting creative uh, solutions. Um, Mark, on the very first map you showed, it's, we're pretty much, you know, like tied to the firehouse. It's like right there in our hood. Um, so, but all of, um, everybody that commented from Tahoe Marina Lakefront desire to have continuation of the lakeside bike, bike trail incorporated into the design criteria, which um, brings me to the next point. One of the criteria the RFI calls for consistency, it, it was kind of buried, I guess, in the community plans um, on an earlier slide. <coughs> Consist it called for consistency with the Tahoe City Mobility Plan. This plan has 12 alternatives to the Lakeside Trail, 10 of which uh, were, part, were on part of the firehouse site, two of which are either a boardwalk in the lake or a path along the lakefront in front of our complex, which would pretty much extinguish our use of the beach and the lake for recreation. Perhaps the county is even considering another, um, other alternatives, such as allowing pedestrians and cyclists to continue up Commons Beach Road as they have been doing, and then restarting on the county parking lot, um, in the county parking lot at the top of Commons Beach Road, such as was done um, with the bike path along, uh, around Sunnyside. But either way, we want to make sure that the RFI includes some accommodation to the bike trail and not preclude all current options, or that the county consider, consider these other options that are not in the mobility plan. During the adoption of the area plan last year, the county said that all feasible options of the Lakeside Trail would be considered. And we simply want to assure that the county doesn't make infeasible 90% of the alignment options that are listed in the mobility plan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, input? Welcome. 
Good morning. My name is Abigail Gallup. I'm a former staff member at North Tau Arts. I just wanted to bring attention to the fact that the building that's being called the Community Center has housed an organization called North Tau Arts, which is our local uh, visual arts nonprofit. And though they haven't been in that building for nearly 30 years, they've been in Tau City and in the North Tau area for that long. And right now that, that space is also used as the community center, meaning um, local organizations gather there in the mornings and they rent the space out for things for the Board of Realtors, for the uh, Lake Tau Garden Club, for the Toastmasters. It's been used to teach yoga. Um, it's a space that's already being used to outreach to the community. Uh, at large and in the arts in general, or specifically. And I think that if you open up the process to the request for information, request for proposals, that you'll get a lot of detailed, thoughtful proposals to keep that idea of use going in our community, and that there is a huge support for the people of Tau City to have something that belongs to us. And I would um, just encourage you to move forward with the request for information and the request for proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Other comment or question on this? OK, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to the board. Supervisor Duran, was there anything you wanted to add or ask? No. Supervisor Holmes? I'll defer to the community. <laughs> Supervisor Wygant? Supervisor Euler. Okay, um, I just want to, one, start by thanking facility staff and Shauna and all the members of the public who did participate in this process to date. Um, I had some uh, very valuable conversations yesterday at the reception, um, and out of that, my recommendations to you would be to make sure that we continue um, in advance of actually putting an RFI out, we actually continue some of this public input. I will say that I heard very much uh, what Shauna identified as well, and I've heard that since the fire department moved uh, from that location, that the, the general, not everyone, I'm not going to pretend it's everyone, the, the general feeling is let's get rid of the old fire station. Um, I would say that the general feeling as well is is there a way that we can keep the building that houses the arts uh, group? If not, is there some way that we can replace it with something that can continue to house the arts group, if not that actual structure? Um, I would say with very few exceptions, people are wedded to the existing buildings. Um, but if there is sort of passion around any of the one particular buildings, it is the arts building. And so just, I think, keep that in mind. I think there are opportunities here to create something that does um, reflect that community desire, uh, to have a community space, a communal space, however we want to define that, whatever word we want to use. Um, and I think that that could involve not just the arts, um, as, as are currently on display in, in the um, arts building, but performing arts um, at, at some sort of scale. It's not a huge site, so this is never going to be a massive you know, performing arts area. But I think it is something that can bring an additional benefit that could multi-purpose, multi-function as arts, meeting space, uh, just space to congregate generally with some outside things, maybe some fire pits for people to hang out at, similar to the park at the other end of Commons Beach. Um, and um, I would just say that, yes, we should move forward with the RFI, but I don't think we should leap on it tomorrow. I think we should do some more outreach around this and take some more time to meet with members of the community and, you know, maybe put a survey monkey or something out online for folks or flash vote uh, to get some additional feedback around this. So those are my comments. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, we'll, any, any other direction that anybody wanted to add? Okay, then uh, we are done with that item. Thank you, ma'am. Did you get the clarification you Yes, needed? that's very helpful. Thank okay. you very much. Great, thank you. All right, we are now going to move to our department items. We're going to start with department item four. Uh, Board of Supervisors minutes were being asked to approve the minutes of June 27th. Supervisor Euler was absent. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Supervisor Euler, thank you. 
We're going to move to item 5A. This is a county executive item. This is uh, an item relating to the proposed Tahoe Regional Arts Center. We're getting a status update. I think the timing on this, given the conversation we just had around uh, the Commons Beach properties, is perfect. Welcome. All arts, all the time. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, good morning again, Madam Chair, Jennifer Merchant uh, with the County Executive Office. I would like to introduce Keith Vogt. He is the Chairman of the Tahoe Regional Arts Foundation that is proposing the stages uh, at North Star Project. Uh, the reason for the presentation today is some great forward progress in uh, negotiating a lease for the proposed property location. This project uh, had some of its initial funding provided through the TOT grant process that Placer County puts forward every year. There were actually two allocations of funding to the project, one in 2013 and one in 2015, totaling about a quarter of a million dollars that has put the project um, in the position where it is today, ready to move forward. So I would like to invite Keith Vote up to the podium to uh, provide the status report and update, as well as a really cool video. Thank you for the opportunity. Good morning, Keith. Good morning. Um, chair <laughs> in absentia, uh, supervisors and CEO. Um, and I'd like to introduce our vice chair, Roger Remper, is here also this morning. And I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Greg and Jeremy for helping me uh, get this up and uh, allowing me to uh, do some special things with our presentation. A guide, we had several guiding principles when we started with this project um, going on four years ago now. And uh, one of those guiding principles was that we were going to think outside the box, which is somewhat of a cliche, maybe, but it really works. And we looked for some creative ways, some creative ideas uh, to guide our principle in designing this facility. As you will see, most of you have seen a previous um, uh, presentation on this, and the basic structure has not changed, but the interior continues to change as we move forward. Um, there's a quote from um, a book by Sarah Williams Gilhagen, as she's an architectural author, How the Built Environment Shapes Our Lives. And this couldn't be any more perfect than for our particular project. The picture in the back happens to be on the location. Designs that offer access to nature, stimulate its greenery, climate, and topography affect us beneficially for the simple reason that people thrive in environments where nature continues to nourish our well-being. We are going to be in the middle of nature. Our current status, we spent, and I did that on purpose, I didn't say three years, I didn't say two and a half. <laughs> 2.9 years negotiating a sublease with Vail, uh, CNL, and EPR because, as you know, uh, the Vail property was sold right toward the end of our negotiating period. So then we had to deal with a new owner of the land. So that added on additional time in our in our process. But on March 29th, we signed um, our sublease agreement. It's a 40-year basic lease with four 10-year extensions for 80-year lease on that 17-acre uh, piece of property, which I'll show you in a minute. I probably won't be there when that extension is over. So, uh, but uh, we also but had to prepare. Robert will, and he'll still be a county supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll sign off on it, I'm sure. <laughs> So in that process, since April, um, we had an update on the, uh, the web management plan, which, by the way, was originally done in 2009 um, on the feasibility of what is possible for North Tahoe. And out of that original study came the concept of three small community uh, theaters, uh, one in Tahoe City, one in Incline, and one in Truckee. But then he recommended a, a regional theater, a much larger facility, uh, located somewhere hopefully in the middle, which is difficult geographically in this area. Um, he recommended either Squaw Valley or North Star, and uh, we chose 
uh, the North Star location. So just a couple of the highlights out of that study, and some of you already know this, that the Tahoe economy is primarily uh, sustained through the travel industry and the TOT uh, money that comes from that. Or 60% of the employment and 51% of the earnings are derived from visitors. And there is a strong and diverse market in the Tahoe area for uh, a performance facility. Uh, Well-educated residents, of which I used to be one, <laughs> um, living, having lived here for 16 years uh, and due to some back issues, uh, the snow and uh, uh, the stairs got to me so we had to move off the mountain. But a significant number of second homeowners also likely to participate in the arts. And a growing visitor population that's staying longer than just the overnighters or the dayers that come up Saturday morning and leave Saturday night. So there is a growing number of those individuals coming. Um, the stages will be a regional venue that supports the arts education, and I'll go into this a little more in detail as we go along because the arts have always, um, education has always been a, a, a passion of mine even from high school days. Um, and that'll be one of our primary directives uh, moving along with live local uh, national presenting and rental business, which I'll share with you in a minute. This I think you'll find very interesting that was just updated and it, there are increased numbers that we're looking at for the uh, one-time impacts of the construction project are going to be significant. Uh, but the ongoing annual impacts uh, because of the uh, audience and the event attendees, spending leads to about 5.3 million in new sales and 1.1 million in new earnings annually. That's not once, that's annually. Where to build it? We spent literally months looking at a number of locations. Uh, as you well know, to do something of this size takes a special piece of property to do that. And we um, finalized on Castle Peak, just above the intercept parking lots at North Star, just inside off of 267, um, just to the right of the roundabout. And uh, we have 1,200 existing parking spaces, so we're very fortunate to have that great a parking area. This is the 17 acres, plus or minus, uh, that we negotiated in our contract sublease with um, Vail and EPR. But you'll also notice this is the future um, Martis uh, Trail coming right near to us, and hopefully that will get uh, approved and done soon so people can ride their bikes from Truckee to a nice summer event in the evening out in the amphitheater. So Williams and Patton are uh, primary architects and planners. Uh, the Shalik Collaborative is our um, uh, theater uh, consultant. And just last night, <laughs> we signed a consulting agreement with the USC School of Dramatic Arts. And I'm very proud to be able to announce that today because David Burdell did, and... Did you say USC? I did. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, just a note on that, Jennifer, my wife and Roger are Cal graduates. You don't think I didn't pay for this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you did the right thing. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> I made the visit as well. Yes. <laughs> We went down and visited the dean and, and the staff, and they were just really excited about uh, they'll be consulting with us as we develop the project because they're doing this on a daily basis, uh, training students now to go out into the field. And so we're very, very pleased uh, to have uh, made this happen, and we're really excited about their um, just a general layout of the, the plan. I'm not going to go through each one of those, but this is the evolving and I want to make sure that you see that it's conceptual and subject to change because as you know when you're building something and you have various consultants and various eyes looking at it you say well maybe we ought to do this. Uh, the black box is a 150 seat uh, experimental uh, theater. This is going to be our teaching facility. Uh, we're inviting the high schools, the community college, uh, Sierra Nevada College, Incline High School, to use this facility because none of them currently have 
extensive drama programs, and we want to provide them the space uh, to do that. Um, so we're really excited about working with uh, those various institutions. The main theater is a 500-seat theater, main stage area, and then the amphitheater, which I'll show you in just a little bit. This is the second floor. This is a 220-seat banquet and multi-purpose room, which we will rent out uh, for use. And our idea is that corporations will come and um, rent this space for corporate meetings, et cetera, as well as weddings and recitals and all kinds of, of different things. But the idea behind this space is a revenue generator. And as most of you know, that theaters uh, can't live on ticket prices, so you have to look at other kinds of ways uh, to raise um, revenue. Um, grand Staircase, which we, in the video you'll see there's only one, uh, but that is now in process of going to two. Uh, the admin space uh, upstairs and balcony seating for 150 seats. Just another concept, uh, the wall along the right hand side there, that will probably not be there when we get to the final um, drawings and the final um, plans for the, but gives you an idea of the size of the amphitheater. Again, you'll see conceptual and subject to change. I want to keep reiterating that, uh, that it's uh, constantly in review. And we're building an iconic theater for great performances. So I want to emphasize again, uh, the following video is conceptual, and it will change as we move forward. By the way, the Sahoe Regional Arts Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, California corporation. <clears throat> Should be some music. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can sing if you'd like. Oh, it'd be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're entering the uh, north side of the theater into the um, amphitheater complex. Again, these are about uh, six weeks old uh, video, and we'll be updating this as we go along. In fact, on Thursday, we're having another um, meeting with our uh, consultant and uh, with the staff at Williams and Patton uh, to review some of the changes that we're making. Um, our idea with that stage is to open that up more and uh, so people can sit and enjoy uh, the scenery. We did this video about uh, three years ago and the change in technology from three years ago <laughs> to today is just phenomenal. And um, so coming back to the entrance, as I said, there's a grand stairway on the right. There will also be one now on the left because of the number of people going up into the second uh, story. The multi-use room is on the left, and we'll go into that in just a moment, but we'll first go into the uh, balcony area. As I said, 150 seats in the balcony with 500 seats in the main floor. Uh, we are designing it so if there's only 300 people or 250 or whatever, the lighting will be such that it doesn't look like it's a, an empty theater. And obviously the balcony would be uh, dark as well. So now going into the multipurpose room with uh, about 220 seats. Um, the difficulty is going to be for a speaker, people are going to be, want to be watching and looking outside. And uh, especially in the wintertime, watching mm -hmm. the skiers come down the slopes. But there are new developments in glass where you can darken the glass. And it's just phenomenal some of the things that are coming along in technology. So we'll be able to darken that out so that 
speakers won't be distracted, or the audience. In our newest update, uh, we're going outside now to come back in, uh, but we're going to extend the lobby now so it takes in uh, the entrance to the uh, black box theater, mm -hmm. so we won't be going outside to go into the black box theater. Again, the black box theater literally is a black box, and it, the seating is very flexible, so you can move it around in any number of different configurations. Um, our latest thought is to also provide just to the right here, uh, once we get into the theater, a natural um, mini amphitheater, probably 50, 60, 75 seats, something like to the right here. And that wall, there's a curtain that comes down and then that wall will also be able to uh, be either uh, drawn up or to the side. So uh, that would be an opening then for, it's just a natural amphitheater. And this is the actual topography um, of the location. Coming back out to do a total aerial view, hidden among the trees. And that's the nice thing about the project is we're not going to have to remove that many trees. Um, it's very sparsely. It's been um, forested probably in the last 25 years. So there aren't any uh, huge trees to be removed. And we want to save every one of them that we can. So just imagine yourself on a nice July evening out for a concert. Again, the foundation supporting the visual and performing arts, and I love the idea of what I hear going on for the arts in the new location downtown, so that's great. And thanks to the Placer County for you um, um, giving us funding to get this underway. So what now? We're continuing to expand our board of directors and ambassadors. Uh, we've added several recently, which we're really proud of. We're re relaunching our capital campaign, uh, beginning the EIR process, which will probably happen next week. Uh, we have a new website under development, and we're developing new partnerships as we move along. So our local arts support, uh, Courtney Simon from the Truckee Community Theater, Tom Beebe is an artist, uh, Elizabeth Archer with Inner Rhythms, um, whoops, uh, Tim Young is CEO of the Reno Phil, and uh, Mike Kazmariski is the CEO president of EDON. EDON is the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada. They see our project as an extension uh, for Reno, and uh, that's the reason the Reno Phil wants to be involved. And uh, Mike is now one of our new ambassadors. And uh, we're really excited about uh, their involvement and in helping us uh, to raise funding to, to build the theater. As I indicated, uh, this is new as of last night, the USC School of Dramatic Arts, uh, the Parasol Foundation, and the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation are both uh, working with us on this so to accept uh, donations uh, for their project, and then the Reno Sparks Tahoe Economic Development Authority. Just real quickly, our, our board, Roger, Sharon Fielder, Carolyn Magan, Tommy Cord, uh, Marcy Bradley, uh, Lee Conant, uh, Lois Ewing, Susan Horst, Eve McInerney is uh, Arts for the Schools, uh, Michelle Morikawa is our latest uh, board member, and she's the uh, general manager of the Welk Properties at North Star. Uh, Blake Reba, Andrew Strain, uh, Jennifer Waddell, uh, Kristen York, and our uh, ambassadors, Ernie Grossman, uh, Larry Heifetz, uh, Jim Porter, and uh, Tom Van Berkham, our, our new um, ambassadors. And then Jess Stevens at the uh, North Tahoe Property Owners Association is an advisor. Scott Ewing and uh, David uh, Bridell from the Dean uh, School of Dramatic Arts. Uh, thanks to Northstar 
to North Lake Tahoe Resort Association and the county for your support in getting us started, and the Tahoe Mountain Resorts Foundation, as well as the Tahoe Trucking Community Foundation. And I thank you. Thank you. Wow, comprehensive overview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any any questions, questions from the board? I like it. Let's move forward. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Supervisor Euler, as a thespian, any comments? <laughs> He's at a loss for words. It's, yeah. it's tremendous vision. The only question that occurred to me as we're doing the little visual tour is, um, I'm sure you've got this covered, but uh, adequate lobby space for intermission during inclement weather. Absolutely. Okay. So you, yes. So you guys, you, you got that. Answer. We've we've designed it for taking care of the 650 if we have the max. Right. Yeah. Okay. And Keith, I, I had to step out for a moment just sure. as the presentation began, but um, can you explain sort of, if you didn't already, and I apologize if I missed it, what are, what are your hours going to be? How is that going to flow with uh, the other uses that we already know exist? At Good Star? question. Uh, we started working on this months ago. In fact, we look um, at what's going on in the village uh, what's going on around the area. In part of our sublease agreement, we have to sit down, not have to, we will sit down with uh, the North Star Marketing Program, Marketing um, uh, Division, and work out an annual calendar of when we have events. Um, we don't want to conflict with uh, ski traffic coming and going, so our times will vary depending on um, the coming and going of, of traffic, especially during the winter time. Mm -hmm. Summer, not so much of a problem, but uh, obviously with ski traffic. And they will be using that parking lot during uh, some of the winter events there in uh, the village. So we're working together to make sure that we all work together. It's all for the benefit of everyone. Good, and I really raised the issue around, I, I saw Peter nod when you were talking about parking, um, and I think you know it's critically important for us to make sure that there is ample parking in that the uses don't conflict with each other. Absolutely. Because if, if they're on top of each other, there's not going to be no. ample parking. No. So, okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Seeing none. Thank um, you. I think this was just an update. Anything that, uh, anything to wrap up? All right. Excellent. We're going to move then to our uh, supplemental agenda item. This is item 5.1. This is on the supplemental agenda. This is the district attorney's item. Uh, this is a Social Security Administration Cooperative Disability Investigations Unit contract. And uh, uh, we're being asked to introduce an ordinance amending the uncodified allocations of positions to the district attorney's office for fiscal year 2017-18 for the hiring of two investigators working a limited term assignment. Presenting today we have our uh, Deputy Attorney Scott Owens and Nuno Tavares and someone I don't recognize, I'm sorry. Uh, Lauren Featherstone. Lauren, of course I recognize you. You're out of context. <laughs> Thank you, good morning. Uh, oh, and, for also, and also, County Council reminds me, we're looking for approval of the agreement. Correct. Uh, Scott Owens, Placer County District Attorney, 10810 uh, Justice Center Drive, Roseville. Uh, first off, thank you for uh, allowing us to present this morning, um, especially up here. What a beautiful drive up. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity th through a competitive process, uh, an amazing opportunity to partner with the Social Security Administration on uh, uh, investigation with regards to uh, Social Security fraud. Um, they are bringing, uh, for, for us partnering and sending them to investigators, they are bringing to the table uh, a total of roughly $2.6 million uh, payable over a five-year period in one-year contracts, uh, roughly between four and, and, and five and some change over the course of those five years, renewable each year. Um, it is a tremendous opportunity for us. I believe that our uh, collaboration uh, with Health and Human Services and the good work that we've done in the area of welfare fraud over the last five years is part of what's contributed us uh, this opportunity to us. I am going to ask Nuno Tavares, our supervising investigator of our Public Integrity Unit Welfare Fraud Unit currently, um, uh, to step up and he's going to do a little uh, talk to you about a, a little bit about it.
Good morning. I always envision myself towering over this thing, but uh, <laughs> evidently that's not the case. I feel your pain, brother. <laughs> so thank you. Good morning, ma Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, Mr. Bosch and uh, Mr. Carton. Thank you again for the opportunity for us to present this. Uh, thank you to uh, our elected DA for the opportunity to tell you about this. So if I'll uh, go into it right away, a little bit of history uh, with the program. So in conversations with the LA, LA District Attorney Chief uh, a while back ago, um, she had mentioned that there was uh, a social security um, a program out there where the Inspector General uh, had these offices called the Cooperative Disability Investigations Units throughout the country, and that they were looking for partners to uh, partner up with to combat uh, fraud and uh, to deliver some of, to continue to deliver uh, some of the services uh, to the folks that need those services. So uh, CDI, uh, the, and I'm sorry, it's the federal government, so all these acronyms, I'll try to make it easy, but CDI, the Cooperative Disability uh, Investigations, uh, consists of folks from the Social Security Administration, Office of the Inspector General, folks from the Disability Determination Services, and then state and local law enforcement. Uh, their mission, again, is to combat fraud and abuse within these disability programs um, through questionable statements and activities of claimants and so forth. Um, currently, there are 38 CDI units covering uh, 33 different states. Uh, in California, we have two. We have one in uh, Los Angeles and we have one in Oakland. In Los Angeles, the LA uh, District Attorney's Office Bureau of Investigation provides those investigative services uh, to CDI. And in Oakland, they didn't have a partner, uh, but again, they have uh, chosen to uh, award the contract to Plaster County should the board adopt the resolution to move forward. Uh, in 2016, uh, the CDI reported that they saved $268 million in just Social Security Disability uh, Program, uh, which actually was more impressive in, in my research was $323 million of that was non-Social Security programs. So these are Medicare, Medicaid, housing assistance, nutri nutrition assistance programs. All those were identified as a result of the work that these CDI units do. Uh, many of these programs are also supplemented with local funds, like general assistance. Um, and so this was a highly competitive process. Uh, Social Security chose Placer County uh, to uh, partner up to investigate fraud. Uh, some of the highlights of the award, as uh, DA Owens mentioned, is that it covers salaries, overtime, benefits, costs associate, associated with uh, district attorney uh, uh, vehicles. So I, I spoke with some of these uh, CDI units across the country and uh, found the majority of them, um, their day-to-day -day work is helping the Social Security Administration make determinations uh, on, on benefits. So excuse me, not make determination, but provide the information so they can make those determinations. So the results of their investigations are forwarded back to Social Security um, so that Social Security can make that decision. Are, are the benefits going to be awarded, continued, discontinued? Just like our welfare fraud program here today, our investigators are fact finders. We merely go out, gather the facts, provide it back to the folks who make the decisions on determination of eligibility and let those folks make those decisions. Uh, they do that through uh, interviews, surveillance, and other traditional investigation uh, techniques. And in a case where one of those investigations leads to a criminal investigation, then those are filed um, just like any other criminal investigation is filed like our investigators do uh, or any peace officer does on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So the results are incredible as far as savings goes. Um, the, the results have been great. Some of the documented success uh, in California, again, speaking with LADA, I spoke with their chief. I also spoke with their sergeant that actually runs the unit because I was curious as, as how things were going there. Um, and I spoke with the assistant attorney general in, in Arkansas. Uh, they found that almost 100% of their cases, uh, the, team, the, the team works, has other public assistant fraud associated with them. In most cases, it, like I mentioned earlier, it's housing assistance, Medicare fraud, welfare fraud. Um, in Placer County, we currently have one investigative, uh, one, one welfare fraud investigator at the DA's office that only works 23% time in in-home support services. It's not uncommon to find IHHS fraud within these programs, um, and having these two investigators assigned to this unit can help uh, this investigator within our own IHHS programs and other local assistance uh, frauds. So Placer County, years ago, before my time, had one of the largest welfare fraud cases, and over 100,000 in welfare fraud. And in that case, there was social security fraud, work comp fraud, um, other fraud that came, came with it. Um, and speaking to risk, the conversation of risk has come up. So 
the work that our investigators do is, again, traditional peace officer work that our, our investigators do uh, every day. Uh, I spoke again with these with these other agencies who are operating either with the same contract that you have in front of you or similar contracts. In LA, uh, their assistant chief said that they service an area of over 18 million folks. Um, they have had not had any lawsuits or any um, uh, litigation brought against them. They spoke very highly of the program. They recently uh, grew to uh, one district attorney sergeant and five DA investigators. In Arkansas, I spoke with the assistant attorney general there, uh, General uh, uh, Warford. He stated that they've been in the partnership with the SSA for over two years, have had no litigation lawsuits against them. And their investigators uh, worked the entire state of Arkansas with tremendous success. They've reported uh, a reduction in waste of abuse uh, in their programs. In addition, they found their investigators um, have led to uh, protecting their public system programs as well. And, and uh, other in, uh, investigations, other criminal investigations, they've been able to provide uh, services. And finally, I spoke with the Oregon Department of Justice. I spoke with their chief investigator, and um, he, he stated that they are in partnership with Social Security, have been for almost seven years. Um, under the same contract, they've had no litigation or lawsuits. Um, they found tr 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 tremendous success as well in the same areas, in, in, in abuse, uh, fraud, and also while helping protect the benefits that are intended for the folks that need those benefits. Uh, they serve the greater good of the Oregon citizens. These are his words. Um, Additionally, there is a cross-designation option, um, which in Placer County, there has been cross-designation of Placer County law enforcement in the past. I believe there still is, uh, where they're cross-designated as U.S. Marshals. Uh, assuming that your board adopts this resolution, that process will begin immediately to cross-designate these uh, DA investigators as U.S. Marshals, and there's some... Um, in, I always mess up this word, I apologize. In, in the notification, um, that uh, kicks into place under federal code 3374. So Kirk, you're, you're laughing at me, but I never can say that word. Um, overall, the partnership uh, in this program, I found that the, it goes again beyond just disability fraud. Um, variety of crimes, including identity theft, uh, f uh, felons, uh, fugitive felons, um, all those that, that help, uh, this program helps embrace. Uh, Plush County has been fortunate uh, to be offered this prestigious award. Uh, this federal money at no cost to Placer County citizens to protect these assistance programs, reduce fraud, waste, abuse, federal, state, and local programs um, that the district attorney's mission has had since the beginning. Uh, we'll work with our partners to continue to protect these dollars that go out to these folks, our citizens, that need uh, this help. Shortly after District Attorney Owens uh, took office, he implemented a public integrity unit. And one of the core missions of the public integrity unit was fraud. And currently today, this unit has the welfare fraud unit, consumer fraud unit, workers' compensation unit, and hopefully shortly with your uh, blessing and your uh, okay, we will have also a social security fraud unit. In conclusion, uh, I just wanted to remind the board that this was a highly competitive process. We should be very uh, proud of Placer County. Uh, uh, proud that uh, your board has uh, put an infrastructure in place with, that allows Placer County to shine, not just here in Northern California, but across the country. So um, I ask, uh, again, that you adopt the resolution in front of you. And I am also here to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right. We'll start with Supervisor Euler. I don't have any questions, but just uh, comments, observations on this. Yes, sir. We are looking at um, the Social Security Trust Fund today uh, is estimated to run out in 17 years. Um, we have uh, longer uh, lifespans, and uh, our baby boomers are retiring. Uh, so less money going in, more money going out as people are living longer. We have an opportunity here to um, make sure that the dollars that are going out were in fact earned. And uh, unfortunately, when it comes to the Social Security Trust Fund, this is a zero-sum game. Every dollar that goes out uh, in the form of, in some form of, of, of fraud or due to some kind of fraudulent activity is one fewer dollar that can be paid to somebody who actually worked and earned it. So uh, I think we have a, a moral obligation to, to the uh, folks of our county uh, to make sure that we do everything that we can to make sure that those dollars that are being paid out are in fact to people who have earned it uh, or have been 
properly awarded it uh, in these cases due to, to uh, disability. And so I thank you for uh, taking the initiative to go after this grant and give us the opportunity uh, to participate in, in what will hopefully be uh, a very successful endeavor of cracking down on, on some of the, the fraud that we do and we know does exist. Thank you, sir. Supervisor Wigand. Yeah, a couple of questions. Thanks. Um, so uh, the concept is new to me. I heard about it, frankly, within the last week or two weeks. So, it, frankly, it's a little bit troubling to me. Because I, whereas as a baby boomer who received his first Social Security payment <laughs> just this month, uh, congratulations, congratulations sir. <laughs> and there's that retirement linkage also. But, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to know where the concept came from. We, you know, the county's linkage to social security management uh, is essentially non-existent. Um, um, you did talk about some uh, synergistic potential benefits like IHSS fraud, uh, but you also mentioned supplemental, supplemented by local funds. So, so my my radar, my uh, alarm system is more concerned about um, state and federal cost creep into the Placer County budget uh, and having seen that for over 20 years with things like realignment, which basically I think is a good idea. I think sadly it was driven predominantly by a state desire to shift cost from the state to the local government in order to balance their budget. Um, and it, had it not been under those circumstances, I think we actually could have worked uh, together uh, better to, to get more constructive ends, but I've talked to our sheriff's department. I know the impact it's had on our local jail system as well as our county exec staff. So, so I'm concerned about all of those kinds of things. And then, of course, recently we've gotten information uh, from county council about the concerns just with the contract in and of itself. So anything you might be able to enlighten me on as it relates to, you know, where did this idea come from? Uh, where is it that the federal government, uh, with regards to Social Security fraud, thinks that the counties are a good fit with partnering? Um, I, just a lot more information for me that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so as far as, again, the, the conversation came as a result of a discussion I was having with the Assistant Bureau Chief at the LA District Attorney's Office, and we were talking about fraud. Uh, I was talking to her about the fraud programs we had here, and she said, oh, Social Security, administration is always looking for partners to investigate uh, social security fraud and I said how does that work she said well they provide uh, funding for cost for for everything for salary benefits and all that and it's it's a uh, it's, it's a process that you apply through and that's how we found out about the program um, and then as far as the federal government wanting to work with the local government really uh, their success has come in LA from working with the prosecutors and getting uh, the prosecution case from the outset and them understanding and getting that buy-in on those cases early on. Uh, cases that the Attorney General's office may not take due to volume, uh, our DA's offices can take. So they've seen success working with District Attorney's office. Um, in regards to local funds, I think I was referring to, I may have misspoken, what I was referring to local funds is our general assistance programs that goes out. Those are often uh, lumped in when, in the fraud investigations that we do. That's what I meant about local funds, sir. So, so the, just one question came in. Who prosecutes, uh, say an investigation reveals uh, some potential fraud uh, and there's an indictment, who prosecutes that? We have the option to prosecute that here locally in Placer County or with the Attorney General's office? The State Attorney General. The State Attorney, or the uh, Federal Attorney General. Okay. Either, all three? Yes, sir. Supervisor Holmes? Supervisor I just wanted to add on. I think that the benefit to be gained from, from, this, from these federal agencies and working local is, is, is we know what the local resources are. We can handle things locally. We're familiar with the area. We can get information, get it quicker. Scott, I think you need to turn your mic on. We can get information, get it quicker, and, and be more of an asset to them in the time that it would take them to bring in somebody, get them to learn what they were doing, get, to, get, to, get them to know the community. Uh, they already have the built-in ties with our office. Uh, dealing with the U.S. Attorney's Office on what they're going to take and what we're going to keep local 
is, is not an unfamiliar thing for us. We do it all the time, particularly on drug cases. And uh, just, just this last week at our law enforcement chiefs meeting, Tim Johnson was from the U.S. Attorney's Office, was, was there uh, addressing our local police chiefs on, on, on wanting to work closer with us on what, what, you know, because of the changes in some of the sentencing laws in California, what it's better to go federal with and what will re re remain local. So you're going to see a blending, and, and there has been more of a blending over the last, you know, I don't know, 20 years or so, uh, with, with us working closely with the federal government on issues. Okay, so let's say, again, there's an indictment sought, uh, am I on? Yes, um, on a Social Security uh, fraud case, how is it determined that that prosecution is done by either uh, Department of Justice, uh, California uh, District Attorney, or so typically the investigating uh, uh, officers will put together a package. Um, you know, they'll work with us beforehand to kind of get a, some general idea about what's going where. We'll take a look at what charges are specific in that individual case because it's going to vary from case to case uh, where that fraud occurred. Um, and, and then we'll, you know, then we will we'll work, uh, that agent will be the liaison, but work with the U.S. Attorney's Office and our office on, on what we're going to prosecute and what they're going to prosecute. Do you have any data on the percentage of cases that are prosecuted by which third? Uh, not currently on this issue. I do, I do not. No, and I think that varies, again, across the country depending on where the agent filed the cases, whether it's with their attorney general's office. As you can see, some of the examples, the investigative units are either housed out of an attorney general, or a local DA's office. Some are even housed out of a, uh, a police department. So it just depends on, on their, on their uh, agreement in that area. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, this this just came came to me on Friday, mm -hmm. and this thing has a lot of moving parts, and I haven't had a chance to be briefed by staff or um, to see exactly what this all means. So we're going to hire two new investigators. Federal government's going to, the Social Security Administration is going to pay for them, and they're going to go to Oakland. The, they are housed, the office is housed out of Oakland because that's where the field office is, but yeah. they'll be working out of our general area, sir. It, it, there's only two offices with CDI. One's in Oakland, one's in LA, and that's why it's listed as Oakland. Okay, so how does this benefit the people of Placer County? So our, the cases that we have here in Placer County um, are, we have multiple, multiple uh, public assistance fraud cases here in Placer County. Um, just alone in Placer County, we had, if I can refer to my numbers, um, just in Social Security investigations um, for 2015, there were 138 allegations of disability fraud. Um, 74 of those were uh, converted to investigations. Uh, in 2016, 113 allegations uh, in Placer County from our Roswell office uh, were, were referred over, but we don't have the resources to work those cases. The federal government doesn't because they don't have the uh, an agreement with a local partner, a law enforcement partner. So this would allow us to work those cases that are here in Placer County. So what's the per percentage of the uh, uh, allegations of fraud compared to how many people are on Social Security? Well, I can speak to, um, in, in Placer County, we have uh, 4,600 disability, uh, we have 4,600 4, um, recipients on SSI and over 7,000 uh, disabled uh, recipients. So those are the two numbers there, uh, just in Placer County alone. Look, again, it has too many moving parts. I haven't been fully briefed on it, so I'm not comfortable making any decision on this at this point until, until I can have more information and just more briefing. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Supervisor Duran. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, you had mentioned that there is an opportunity here to have deputization. And going to the question of risk, does that deputization uh, of officers lower the risk? And I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. And I'd also like to hear Jerry's concern or, or his r response to that as well. Um, any comment on that? So I'm. Um Going to go off what I read on on this section 3374, which uh, essentially, uh, by a deputy being cross designated as a, as a U.S. marshal, their work within the um, um, that job within that job within that uh, designation, and therefore it takes some of the liability off of uh, 
the county and puts it back to the government because they've now cross-designated the agent. Because so, they're now a government agent. Because now they're acting I'm, as a government agent. And I'm I apologize. Yes. Okay. Apologize okay. for the layman sure. uh, explanation no, I, of that. I know you're not a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> and, and Jerry, is that consistent with what you read in the contract? Hey, the cross-deputization would lower the risk for the employee because it would allow the federal government to defend and indemnify the employee, but it wouldn't apply <coughs> to the county. And uh, it, the contract makes clear that the uh, federal government would not defend and indemnify the county. And in addition, the cross-deputization in the, in the agreement is uh, at the discretion of the uh, Social Security Administration. And, uh, and in fact, if they, uh, if they have problems with a person who's cross-designated, they can uh, remove them from the unit and the district attorney's office would be required to send another uh, investigator instead. Uh, the agreement defines the terms of the relationship and right. the relationship is a procurement process where the government has procured two investigators. Uh, for instance, if they're gone for two weeks, the D district attorney has to provide a substitute for those two weeks. Okay. So it's, uh, it, it might have appeared to be a grant or a, uh, task force, but it's the contract, the agreement makes clear it's a procurement and they're procuring services for a five-year term at, at the option of the federal government to renew. So, so I guess stepping back, uh, another question that I would have is that it appears to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if this unit isn't doing welfare fraud, nobody's doing. Is that correct? If no, if this unit is not doing um, social, social security, correct. Yeah, if those 38 units across the United States aren't doing investigating this fraud, nobody's doing it. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, the second question is, Jerry, you had pointed out that there were two uh, things or s several things that you had concerns with with regards to the contract overall. And that one of those things uh, being that there was not an out clause, correct? That Correct. we could get out, yeah, you know, if, if for whatever reason. The federal government can terminate. The federal government decides whether to agree to an option. The county doesn't have that authority. Right. Okay. And then the sec and then the second one was an, uh, an indemnification, a cross or indemnification. Is that right? Well, this generally that the contract, since it's a procurement contract, put, places all liability on the uh, entity providing the services, which is the county in this case. So what you're looking only through the cross deputization can the county avoids some of that risk. Right, okay, okay. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Now, as far as the two people, what, what, what how would you approach um, putting those two people on? Is that gonna be from existing DA staff or are you looking for an acquisition of two positions or how does that work? So we, we chose two folks that we believe would fit the uh, job description that the Social Security is looking for uh, nationwide, which is experience with doing surveillances and doing uh, some uh, undercover work, accessing, accessing computer databases. And we've identified two folks within our uh, uh, office who would do a really good job in, 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 in the work that is being proposed here. Okay, so that, so that would cover the person and the equipment. Would the, would the county be on the hook for the vehicles or is that gonna be paid by, um, by um, this program. So the vehicles, when it comes to the vehicles, uh, the uh, mileage is reimbursed in the contract, um, I believe at 50 something cents a mile, which generates, if I remember correctly, uh, about 40,000 a year um, for the vehicle costs, which uh, again, it's at a federal mileage, mileage rate. We have vehicles in our fleet uh, that we'd be using and then using the reimbursement from uh, the federal government for that mileage to, uh, at a future date, procure, procure uh, another vehicle if needed. And, and in with regards to those two persons again, yes, sir. any overtime is going to be absorbed by your own department. Is that correct? Or no, the, no, the, the grant, uh, excuse me, the contract calls for overtime to a certain level. Right. Paid for by them. Right. Paid for by them, but then if they meet that level, who pays for the, who pays for the overtime? That will come out of the district attorney budget. Okay. All right. Um, uh, one final just comment, you know, I deal, outside of this job, I deal with quite a few uh, government agencies. And uh, Robert's question uh, with regards to, you know, who prosecutes, actually I had one of those situations recently where the U.S. attorney failed to prosecute and they actually kicked it back down to my client. So now I'm actually the prosecutor 
of uh, a fraudulent thing. So hmm. I think that's what they're talking about is an option. If it doesn't meet a certain threshold, they'll provide you the opportunity to prosecute, but you still have to meet those civil procedure requirements, meaning that the fraud has to take place in Placer County, right? Right. So, so we're not going to be prosecuting frauds that occur in Alameda County or Oakland or, or any other county. So if it originates here in Placer, you would be prosecuting that. Correct. We would be jurisdictionally bound. Okay. So that is the nexus between what what we're doing here as far as how that ben how that could benefit Placer County. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so I don't have a problem, you know, the, the one thing that strikes me is that nobody else is doing this type of work but those 38 units. Mm -hmm. um, that's just really concerning, and especially in California, only one unit in L.A. County. So, um, you know, I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm okay going down this road with the exception that those concerns, and I would like, if we do decide to go down this road, to have um, uh, Jerry... Uh, communicating with the program manager to make sure that those uh, concerns that Jerry has are incorporated in any contract down the road. Um, because I do think that if we get into a situation down the road where, you know, things aren't going well or, or something happens, that we should have that opportunity to to uh, to get out if, you know, if, if it comes to that. Um, I think we may be overthinking the liability issue quite a bit, and, and, and I, I recognize the points that Jerry's made, but at the end of the day, every single crime that we investigate in Placer County um, comes with a, a, a liability cost, an exposure. Uh, this is a crime that's occurring in Placer County, and that's on us. That's on our citizens. That's on uh, uh, my department. It's on the Sheriff's Department. It's on Roseville PD when they investigate a crime. We have, you know, it's part of what comes with it. Uh, these are crimes that are occurring in Placer County. Because of this partnership, we are getting some coverage, some indemnification, because they're going to be sworn in as U.S. attorney, as a, as as U.S. marshals. Um, you know, if we get a complaint and we go out and investigate this case on our own, we're absorbing at that point every single bit of liability, yeah. um, which could very well happen, especially now that we know uh, the depth of. of of the fraud that's taken place here in Placer County. Um, so I think we're, we, we may be overthinking it just a bit. And, and I get that. Um, you know, I, I, the, the thing that really concerns me is that as opposed to a grant, if at the end of the day people leave, all we're left with is the language in that contract. And, uh, and, and I know, uh, you know, in dealing with these other agencies that they are amenable to some changes that make sense. And I don't see anything in the two changes that Jerry suggested that that don't make sense and that why they wouldn't do it. If for whatever reason that doesn't happen, then we have to come back and have another discussion as to whether or not we're willing to absorb that, um, that liability. But, but I get what you're saying as far as what, what you're doing. And, you know, as a matter of fact, when you think of it in the broader context, we've got, and this is no, nothing against the, the SO, but, but we've got 229 folks out there at any one time that could not of their own volition be tagged with a lawsuit at any time, you know, along with the vehicles. Absolutely. So, so I get that, I, you know, but if, if my general counsel is telling me that he's got some concerns, I have to heed those concerns. And I think that it, it's a small price to pay to go back and have Jerry involved and engaged in the, in the discussion to make sure that those changes are, are, are done. And if they can't be done, then we come back and, and you know, we, we have a broader discussion about absorbing the liability as it is. I guess what it comes down for me is I don't like to have a contract forced on me. <laughs> you know, as, as, a, as a county supervisor, we're in the business of take it or leave it. <laughs> you know, not, not, uh, not the other way around. So. It, in the risk analysis, the reason it's significantly different in this case is uh, these employees are going to be assigned to the Oakland office that serves the entire Northern California area from, uh, I don't know how far down it goes, but all, all the way to the Oregon border. And uh, that, although the county, you know, accepts the risk of its uh, employees' activities when they're performing their duties in Placer County or even in the surrounding area of Placer County, it's a, it's a significantly different matter to cover the entire state. And, and in fact, if the, if the crime is in Napa County, I assume they'd have to liaison with the Napa County District Attorney because that's where that state crime would be prosecuted. Yes, sir. And, and as sworn peace officers in the state of California, it's not uncommon for us to enforce 
laws throughout the state. We make arrests in other areas of the state, and we absolutely work closely with the jurisdiction in the area, letting them know that we'll be enforcing uh, whatever crime it is, that we'll be filing a crime with that DA, that we'll be, we'll be serving a warrant. Whatever the activity is, doing a surveillance, we work closely with our partners uh, throughout the state of California. But as sworn peace officers in the state of California, we it's, it's not uncommon for us to do uh, business outside of uh, Placer County. Yeah, just a, a couple of questions uh, on follow up to a couple of these things. So, these two guys come to work for, or two people, I'm sorry, come to work for your office. Where is it, where, you've already identified two folks that you think would fit the bill. Where do they live? In the Auburn area. Okay. Um, they report to somebody who sits at a desk in Oakland for federal purposes, right? How are they tasked on a day-to-day -day basis? Who, who, who brings to their attention uh, that there might be uh, uh, some kind of fraud that needs to be investigated? Who, who tasks them on a daily basis? So at these CDI units, each CDI unit across the country has a team leader. And the team leader uh, gets cases that is sent from referrals from tip lines, Social Security Administration, from all these different uh, areas. They get that case, um, they look at the case, they look at it for merit for to see if there's worthy to be signed to an investigator. At that point, it's assigned uh, to the investigator to work the case, and then the investigator uh, works the case. They're not in Oakland every day. I think they, uh, on average, report once, twice a week down there. Otherwise, we have spaces here in our district attorney's office, here in our office, a lot of, a lot of field work, as you can imagine. Uh, the work here uh, requires that our investigators are making observations out in the field. Right. So let's say today um, I, my, I, I realize my neighbor is receiving Social Security disability and my neighbor is performing a high wire act somewhere and, and I'm thinking this doesn't add up. I, 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 who am I calling today? Yes, who am I calling? Who's going to? Do I call the district attorney's office today? Do I call the sheriff's department today? Actually, I live in Roseville, so do I call the police department today? How would it happen today versus what would happen under the scenario where we have these two people that are under contract? So great, great question. The, the, the way to report the crime today is the same as anywhere. It's a, it's a tip line, it's a website. If you go on Social Security's website, they have a link, to, I want to report fraud. That goes to um, the Oakland CDI unit because that's our area. And then, as you can see, um, it sits there. So today, that same tip goes into CDI. We have two Placer County investigators who can then be assigned that case and work it. But, but today, we don't have those two. What I'm saying is... So they sit there. I'm sorry? So the tip goes the same way via a... And, goes Oakland, and, and do we know if anybody's going to be assigned? And, and so what, what I think I'm hearing you say is that this is a way for Placer County to play a role in assisting the federal government investigate these crimes, facilitating the investigation of these crimes as a local partner who's willing to bring on these folks on a temporary basis to ferret out these crimes and then it gives us an opportunity to see is this working? Is it worth it? Have we saved the taxpayers a substantial amount of money through our efforts? Have we incurred liability that we otherwise might not have incurred? What is our risk? I mean, we're talking about the liability here. Anybody who's been on this board for more than a year knows that other than land use stuff, it's stuff regarding law enforcement that we hear about in closed session more than anything else. Sure. Um, so we, we get that there's liability associated with law enforcement. This is simply the county playing a role in facilitating the investigation of potential fraud where otherwise it wouldn't be investigated. Is that? If, if, That's if exactly I, what I said, sir. <laughs> and if I could add on to that, it's more, it's an organized streamlined role. Uh, you know, currently if we got that, we would investigate. We, we, Nuno and his folks would go out and we would investigate that at county cost, at county expense, at county liability. That's what I, I guess that's the part I was missing. So, so my neighbor who's doing the high wire act 
if Oakland gets a hold of it and they send it up to Placer County, now Nuno has to be pulled off of whatever he's working on to go to the circus and watch my neighbor in a high wire act instead of one of these people going and doing that. Absolutely correct. Yes, you said it much more eloquently than I did. But. <laughs> well, that's because I employed a circus master. So. Okay, thank you. That helps. Thank, thank you, sir. That, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. I, I do have a couple of questions, um, uh, clarifying questions around this. So you indicate that this whole conversation came out of a conversation with the district attorney's office in Los Angeles. Yes, ma'am. When was that conversation? Late last year. Late last year. When did we apply for this contract? It was sometime in February. And who else applied for the contract? I know of at least two other district attorney's office, but I believe that there was more. Okay. So it was... You, you described it as highly competitive, and I'm just trying to understand what the context of highly competitive means. So there's... Uh, the federal government keeps communication at a, ver at a minimum prior to awarding contracts. So, um, you know, hearing here and there that this is... Uh, highly competitive because of the amount of um, services that the federal government pays for, they receive a, a lot of applications. So through colleagues, I have found that other district attorney's offices in our immediate area applied. I believe one in the Bay Area applied as well. Mm -hmm. I know that in LA, there's, there was a lot of competition for this same, uh, same contract. Okay. Um, in your staff report, you note that um, in 2016, there were 113 claims uh, referred with 49 of them being investigated. Um, what has the upshot of those investigations been? Those were with the, 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 f the federal government, so those stayed within CDI. No, understood. Um, have we found that there was actual fraud with those referrals? I do not have that information. So, so we don't know don't if there was anyone who was actually identified as having committed fraud. I think they identified those as potential fraud. That's why they were assigned. The results of the outcomes of those investigations were not released to me. Okay. I'm frankly just struggling with what benefit this actually brings us. I mean, I understand that there is fraud. I do not disagree with that. As, as, as a someday, hopefully, recipient of Social Security, mm -hmm. I would really like it to be there when I do retire. Um, but I'm just really trying to understand what is the ROI for Placer County in this. Um, and, and I'm not hearing anything that I can really put, sink my teeth into. And so I'm kind of struggling with the same thing Supervisor Holmes is struggling with. Mm -hmm. Lack of notification around this entire process and discussion. Um, no real uh, significant data that we can point to that says this is the outcome. Um, so we'll leave that for the time being since neither of us has that data. Um, if, a, if a Social Security fraud case is brought forward, it is prosecuted, whether it's by us or the state or the, at the federal level, where do those dollars go if fraud is identified? Are you referring to the, um, uh, the restitution? Yes. So typically, and I'll speak for the wall for fraud cases, the restitution goes back, in our, in our case, it goes back to Placer County. Okay. So it goes out to the those paying the um, the program. And historically, what have we seen come back in the county? In welfare fraud, for example, mm -hmm. we see on average um, about two to three hundred thousand a year coming back. Um, and then I'm giving you a generic number that's off the top of my head. I know that we identify about twenty thousand to thirty thousand a month in fraud in welfare fraud alone that goes over to the DA's office to get prosecuted. Okay. Um, you also uh, Supervisor Montgomery, I'd also say that that's recovered, uh, but there's also the, the prevented factor as well for, because uh, moving forward, there's, there's future fraud that's pre prevented as well. We may not get that money recovered as restitution back into our coffers, but we've prevented future monies from going out as well. And, and that's an excellent point. And I did, you know, once I heard about this last week, um, I, I did a lot of research yes, around welfare fraud, and it's, it's very clear that the, um, the biggest bang for our buck, and if you go on the SSI or the Social Security site, they will tell you this, is actually prevention. Yes, ma'am. And not these investigation and restitution programs. So, um, you know, I, I, I kind of struggle with if we're putting the cart in front of the horse here. And I think, you know, as, as a taxpayer and someone whose, you know, responsibility is to my local taxpayers who pay local, state, and federal taxes. So these are taxpayer dollars, whether they're local or not. Um, you know, my concern is, can't we do a better job? Can't the feds, 
working with the state and locals do a better job of prevention. Uh, you know, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. And I, I think that's where we can really be effective in, in um, stopping the, the, the fraudulent money from going out where the savings happens. I agree with you 100%. Once we identify that the, the, the money that was going out to uh, this case was, was, shouldn't have been going out, and we stopped that, and that's a savings going forward for however long that person's going to be on aid. I think it's a quantifiable number. I think it's a fair yeah. number. Yeah. Absolutely. My point is, if we put more resources to actually looking at the applications that come in ahead of time before we award those Social Security dollars to people who may turn out to be engaging in fraudulent behavior, we save a lot more money up front at a much lower cost to the taxpayer. Sure. So that's not really a conversation for us. That's at the federal <laughs> level, but I think we should be encouraging our federal partners to better fund that. Um, you mentioned that um, there are two positions that would need to be uh, reallocated from our existing employees who would fill these, is that correct? So currently we are looking at two investigators who are employed by the district attorney's office due to their experience and uh, their resumes to send to uh, this program should, should your board uh, approve it. I so, so yes, ma'am. who fills those positions if they move into this, these other positions? So I believe the resolution um, at the request of, of council asked for two additional uncodified positions. Um, so that's what part of the resolution I believe is. So we would need to hire two additional staff to, to fill in for these folks and we, we would have to pay their costs. So that's the, the resolution now. We um, initially when we uh, looked at this we were going to send two folks that we have currently within our office and use the funding from the federal government to pay for those positions and it was our existing uh, allocations. But as I read the uh, agenda item now is that we are asking for two uncodified investigators to backfill the two investigators being sent to the task force. So, so we would have to hire two new people? Yes ma'am. Okay. Um, and at what pay grade uh, would these investigators be? hired, transferred, whatever language we're using around that, and at what pay grade would these two new replacements come in? So that for sure is outside of my expertise, so if I may have uh, Lauren Featherstone or like the DA answer that. Like all of our positions, we, we bring them in at the position that they're rated at and their level of experience and uh, what it would take to get their talent on board. Uh, sometimes that's an A step, sometimes that's a B step, sometimes that's an E step. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we try and pick the best person for the position and then, and then fit them within that. And in this case, what is that uh, step? I it was uh, step three. Which is? Out of five. Out of five. Yeah. And that's for the folks who would be going to Oakland as well as the two replacements? No, I believe the folks that will be going to Oakland were, uh, were they step five or were they, what, what, what step were they? Step five currently. So they're at our maximum step. Correct. So anything moving forward, if they were subject to just standard county raises, would take them above step five? Well, the step five would adjust, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I share Supervisor Holmes' concerns around this. I, I think the process has not worked in this case. I think the fact that it sounds like at least three of us were not made aware that this was even moving forward um, when we are struggling with staffing you know, very clearly critical county positions right now that have very clear and defined ROIs to the county. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very frustrating for me. I'm going to leave my comments at that right now and open this up to the public if there's... Kind of, kind of so, please. Um, so, a so, uh, couple of questions. Um, I know a lot more than I did before this uh, issue started and I'm getting a little bit better the nexus potentially. Uh, but in that vein, uh, so these two folks are going to be assigned investigations by this team leader. Yes, sir. Is with Social Security. Uh, will they be assigned cases outside of the county or just in the county? They could, working as a task force, they could be assigned cases that, that fall within the general area that are outside of the county. But they would have some kind of regional linkage or none at all? That is the intent, sir. To have a, a, yeah, because we have enough, we can see from our referrals here that there is work here in Placer County. Okay, so um, uh, the other question is, um, 
uh, you've heard a lot of questions and, and you've heard some from me. What what kind of a time frame are we under here? I mean, I think in a couple of weeks, I would love to meet with you folks individually and we can just talk through this mm -hmm. a lot more. Um, and I can get you a list of questions if you need more from the kinds of comments we're raised today, but I, I don't know what our schedule looks like, whatever, but a couple of weeks, even a month, I guess, would uh, make me feel a lot more comfortable. So time is of the essence. Um, we were originally told that this was gonna be going as a, um, uh, a, as a consent item um, some time ago, and uh, July 17th is the date that the feds are looking at uh, wanting this thing uh, implemented, so we are already well past that. Um, so we are hoping that they'll hold on as long as we, it takes us to get these issues resolved, obviously, uh, so because we don't want to lose the $2.6 million. I, I'm but sorry, but we with, believe that's with all we're due at. respect, if time is of the essence, why were conversations not had with the full board of supervisors leading up to this so that we could act in a fully informed fashion? So, so I, I had conversations with two board members. I'm always cognizant and very careful uh, regarding potential Brown Act violations, so I was very careful about I uh, did not want to approach a third so, uh, on so anything be, other than I, procedural I, issues. Perhaps I may need to explain the Brown Act to you, and I apologize if I sound rude. You can speak to all five of us. As long as we do not violate the Brown Act by exchanging more information than just one-to-one, -one, you're perfectly clear. I understand that. Okay. Um, in addition, I was what we, we've been working with the CEO's office since April on this issue. Um, and through continuously through June, as it became as as we were awarded the uh, uh, the grant um, moving forward, so we we did not anticipate, and I still uh, uh, do not see the liability issues that council does. I, I appreciate council's opinion. I, I don't I don't see those. I don't see those as a big issue. Um, uh, to me, this is a, a, an amazing opportunity for $2.6 million to investigate a crime that needs to be investigated in our community. And and we are putting it at risk by not moving forward. So yes, we're moving forward faster than I would have preferred, um, but it's not my $2.6 million. Ma Madam. I completely understood that it's not your $2.6 million. I'm frustrated that the process did not seem to work as it should have. Yeah. M may I speak? Yes. Ro ro okay. So being first time here uh, in front of the board and with my elected DA, um, I make this observation. I see that there's a lot of frustration. I appreciate the frustration with process. Uh, and I think that as uh, we can work together, I think we have a great county government. I think we can work together to fix processes going forward to ensure that as we go on to new ventures that we do that uh, in a way that um, works for everyone. Uh, I think where we're at now and looking at $2.6 million to investigate fraud to uh, at the full cost of the federal government is the item that um, unfortunately is being scrutinized because of the process. So I see them almost as two uh, separate issues. I'm just making an observation. I'm asking for anything. Just again, the willingness to move forward and fix whatever processes need to be fixed. Uh, but again, the intent is to serve our citizens here and to do the best we can to protect the, the fraudulent dollar uh, that goes out and to give the services to those who absolutely need it. Uh, understood, and to, to, to be clear, I'm concerned about more than just process here. Um, I'm not a process wonk, and I'm always willing to go outside of process if it makes sense. I think there are some significant um, fiscal and legal exposures mm -hmm. um, associated with this as well. I wanna make sure that taxpayer dollars, whether they're local, state, or federal, are being used most effectively. Um, and I think there are also some policy questions here about, you know, is is there a desire on the part of the board sure. to move outside what are already um, our clearly defined core county missions? And and this may fall into that, but we haven't had that discussion. Yes, ma'am. And that's that's a little bit of the frustration I have. Any other questions from the board before I open it to the public? No, no I'm just going to say, uh, uh, Madam Chair is that I'm really frustrated to the point where, you know, you don't want to hear what I have to say. And we'll talk about it, uh, you know, in closed session. Um, this thing's been on here, sure we uh, well, maybe not in closed <laughs> session, sure but, but outside <laughs> of that, um, you know, this thing has been on the docket uh, since April. And um, for whatever reason, it hasn't gone, you know, there, there hasn't been a whole lot of movement. And I'm not going to point any fingers at anybody, but all I'm saying is, is that it shouldn't have been like this. 
that's that's the end of it. All right. So you know, um, you know, throwing stuff at Scott or throwing stuff that doesn't help the situation. Situation is is that we've got an opportunity here. This item needed to come to the board so we can make a decision. Now, I've I've already said that I'm willing to support this under certain conditions. And moving forward, I'm sure we can get other additional information. The problem that we have here is we're dealing with a federal government that doesn't like to show its hand quite often. You know, and, and in order to get the other additional information that we may need, we may need to show our hand and say, okay, let's start talking about this contract piece. You know, that's, that's all we're asking is that we're under the gun here, or they're under the gun. Um, I certainly don't want this to go to some other agency if we can do it. Um, just because I think it's a, it, it makes Placer County look really good. I have the same concerns about taxpayer dollars as well. So, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to wrap myself in the taxpayer dollar thing, but the fact of the matter is, is that if it's not being pursued and we have an opportunity to have it pursued with federal dollars, then I think that's a good thing. So anyway. All right, at this time, I'll open this up for any public comments. Is there any member of the public who would please come forward, identify yourself, and uh, we'd be very interested in hearing your comments. Excuse Welcome. Me, Sorry. Um, my name is Merrill Haber. I'm a local resident here. Um, this is a first impression thing for me as well. Uh, I showed up today and um, heard all the comments, and I just want to express a couple concerns. One is the urgency that I think Jennifer uh, aptly described here. It seems to be a great sense of urgency today to have this be decided today. And I, I with all the questions raised, I, you know, at risk of uh, sounding uh, like a worry ward, uh, I think all these concerns have to be addressed and, and in relatively sh short order. Another concern I have is the diversion, potential diversion of resources. Again, I'm not uh, on your staff, and I don't fully understand everything going on here, but what I heard a few minutes ago, it sounds like we're going to be assigning uh, Step 5 folks over to the Oakland office, and we'll be diverting some of our uh, existing staff here to this particular project. My concern is, again, whether these resources uh, heading to the uh, Social Security uh, situation, which is grave, no question, but my question is, what is uh, being taken away, if anything, with respect to resources? Are we going to lose experienced investigators within the county work on other important matters? Are we going to divert the attention of some of the assistant DAs who may have other issues that may have both economic and uh, reduced crime yields for us? And finally, I, and I don't know the answer to this, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, July 17 as the drop dead date, if you will, from the federal government. Is that correct? Uh, July 17th was the date that they wanted us yes. to hit okay. the ground. With Have on. we made any efforts to extend that deadline? Uh, and to me, the, the, the immediate step, if it's possible, would be to contact the uh, relevant officials and say, we have some significant uh, issues that our uh, county government would like to address. Can we have an additional two weeks? Uh, that would be the first thing I would consider doing. I don't know if you have or not, but of, I, I of think... Of course we have, sir. What yes. I'm understanding is a lot of folks on the board have similar concerns. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comments. Um, I will bring it back to the board. Uh, Nuno, was there anything in addition that you wanted to well, no, state? I, I don't know if I'm supposed to stand here or not. <laughs> it's entirely up to you. If you have something additional to add, you may feel free to stand there and add it. Just want to thank you for our first memorable time in front of the board. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to offer County Council a chance to add anything that County Council might want to add at this point. Oh, I just wanted to ask Nuno if there have been any discussions with the Social Security Administration about an addendum. that. That was the sort of the takeaway from the meeting that occurred in, on July 17th. Um, I sent an email regarding uh, or letting them know that there was um, some questions from county council. And it, I think the response was that they would just have to be in contact with uh, you and that there's two levels. Uh, there's the Social Security Administration uh, Council and then the Office of Inspector General Counsel. So there really wasn't much substance to the response. Any questions or comments from the board? Yeah, Madam Chair, if I, if I may, we, you know, Placer County, 
uh, has actually a very strong track record of being on the forefront of multi-jurisdictional task force. Task force is, task force I. Um, I, I think back to when we helped establish the High Tech Crimes Unit uh, that was multi-jurisdictional with Sacramento County, uh, and, and Mike Menz has gone on to national fame with his work with the High Tech uh, Crimes Task Force. Uh, we uh, are, are um, uh, auto theft uh, task force that we form with multiple jurisdictions, uh, including the state. We, we have been good partners. This is an opportunity for us to continue to be good partners in an area that is uh, clearly deficient in uh, investigative capacity, and uh, we have an opportunity to do it um, at no new net cost, uh, obviously backfilling the, the folks that would be moving over, uh, at no new net cost, and, and I think it is a uh, very reasonable, very prudent use of, of the federal dollars that they're willing to make available, and so I will make the motion that we approve the request. Uh, I, will make, I will second that motion, but um, uh, with the caveat that we address those two concerns in Jerry's memo, if that's, if you'd be willing to accept that. To the extent that we are able to engage in the conversation and explore what flexibility the federal government uh, will demonstrate in making modifications to contracts. Um, having served as the district director for a member of Congress, I can tell you that in dealing with the General Services Administration and trying to negotiate private sector leases, I found them to be less than cooperative in wanting to amend their contracts um, and so my concern is that, yes, we do everything that we can to uh, alleviate county council's concern, but candidly, um, we, we, are, we are in the business of um, creating liabilities when we enforce laws. Somebody's going to get ticked off when we enforce the law. Uh, people don't willingly go to jail. So uh, we will be sued, and, and we will incur liability, and, and, and we will be named in things going forward. Uh, that's just the nature of law enforcement, as, as we all know from innumerable conversations in closed session. So while, yes, I would like us to do um, everything that we can to work toward a more beneficial contract for our purposes, I would hate for that to be the reason that we lost these funds. So uh, I'm encouraged, uh, Supervisor, that there are other contracts, permutation of contracts out there. So with that, if it's the goal that we negotiate a better contract, but ultimately we have to fall back on, on something different, I think I'm okay just as long as we're engaged in that exercise. And I agree with that. Supervisor Wigand. Well, I guess, you know, in a nutshell, uh, I'm not ready to vote for that motion with that discussion today. Uh, so that is just what it is. I'm probably two weeks I could get that resolved, frankly. Uh, so if I don't consider the risk exposure to be it's devastating, nice. but it's there. And so if the Social Security Administration is going to sign cases uh, to these two people, from anywhere, and there's no uh, clear uh, connection to benefit to Placer County, uh, and or not knowing whether or not there's any consideration for any contract modifications. Um, it, it, the whole, and, and I suspect that that's probably not the case, which is sad, uh, because if, if it was the case, the, the whole program wouldn't have any merit. I mean, why would the Social Security Administration even consider doing this kind of thing and trying to connect with local governments if, in fact, it wasn't, there wasn't some benefit to local government. But what I do know, I, you know, I heard about this on Tuesday. I did have one conversation with Jerry. Uh, what I do know is the contract falls completely short of articulating those benefits to Placer County. Uh, so maybe it can still be good enough, but uh, I, I just, I'm too troubled by uh, circumstances, the information that I currently have today. So. Um, 
and you know, Jack, your your you know potential uh, modification to the motion. It, I mean, it could you know it could have ended up being a, a fatal. You know, Jerry actually reported back that he couldn't get any of his his answers resolved, and that could have killed the motion in itself. So I guess you know if that's where we are, you know, I'm good for bringing this back in a couple of weeks. But I certainly want to have a meeting with your team, Scott, and. Uh, and some further follow-up information, and, and I, I'm guessing at the end of the day I'd be perfectly happy, but I'm, but I'm not there yet. Madam Chair, I would withdraw my motion and move that this item be continued to the August 8th board meeting. Second. <laughs> 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 Any uh, additional comments on that uh, amended motion and second? I'm good with that. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We will see you all again on August 8th. Thank you. And hopefully before then for some meetings. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to move to item 6A, Human Resources, Workers' Compensation, Insurance Claims, yes. Services. Uh, Judy Laporte presenting. I'll Welcome. make Nuno feel very tall. You're feeling very tall. No, I'll oh, make Nuno feel very tall. Okay. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Judy Laporte with Human Resources. This item before you request your approval of a renewal of a competitively awarded contract with Intercare Insurance Holdings. They are our third party administrator for workers' compensation claims. We're looking to extend this contract for two years, beginning January of 2018, and hopefully have an opportunity for an option to renew for two additional one-year terms. Um, Intercare has been a valued partner with us since 2011. They've helped us manage the um, cost and the benefits associated with our workers' compensation claims, and they're interested in continuing that relationship. Um, so interested, in fact, that they have offered a 2% renewal in the first two years and a 3% per year increase should we go beyond that, which is in contrast to the current agreement, which has a 2% increase each year. So <laughs> due to the amount of this contract, it could not go on your consent calendar, um, but we have been working closely with our purchasing manager and he supports this action. I'm happy to answer any questions you have and um, thank you for your consideration. Any questions from any member of the board? I see none. Any questions or comments from any member of the public on this? I see none. What's the pleasure of the board? Move approval. Second. We have a motion, Holmes, a second, Duran. All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank All right, you. we're going to move to item 6B, a memorandum of understanding between Placer County and the Placer Public Employees Organization. Judy Laporte also presenting. Thank you. This item before you is the result of a collaborative effort between the representatives of the Placer Public Employees Organization and the county. After several months of labor negotiations, agreement was reached on a new memorandum of understanding. This was ratified by PPO members earlier this month with approximately 88% of those voting, voting in favor of the agreement. We're now requesting your board's approval of this agreement and the accompanying ordinances to enact these changes, some of which will extend to the confidential and the unclassified non-management employees. I would like to highlight just a couple points in the uh, PPO MOU. Please report this is a five-year agreement. It will be going through June of 2022. The agreement um, grants general wage increases, totaling 11% over the five-year term. Also provides for one-time equity adjustments of 6% for deputy probation officers and public safety dispatchers. We're increasing the life insurance for PPEO represented members to $50,000, which is what other county employees enjoy. Additionally, beginning with adoption of this agreement, new hires into Tahoe-based assignments will be required to meet a residency requirement that they live within the basin in order to receive the Tahoe supplemental pay. And that supplemental pay will be gradually increased in 2018 and 2019. Another new um, component of this agreement is early in 2019, when our new payroll system goes live, we will have another salary range for new hires. This will be comprised of 10 steps with 2.5% between steps as opposed to the existing range with 5 steps and 5% between ranges or between steps. That should yield some cost savings going forward as long as um, our new system is up and running. We should start to see those savings in 2019. All parties worked really hard to reach this agreement and I would like to briefly acknowledge the efforts of the PPO bargaining team. 
Aaron Johnson, who I believe is in the audience, Matt Bartholomew and Brandy Dunkel, as well as their chief negotiator from Local 39, James Britton, who is also with us today. And give thanks to our chief negotiator, Deborah Glasser, as well as our CEO's office and our county council's office for their support. That uh, concludes my report. I'm answer, happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions from any member of the board? Seeing none, any questions or comments from any member of the public? Please come forward. Identify yourself. Good morning, my name is Aaron Johnson and I work for Placer County. I work at the probation department. I'm also the president of PPEO and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for the successful negotiation that we had and we look forward to the next five years. I think we all do, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other public comment on this? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Anything to close with? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. Second. Yeah. Yep. Just want to thank staff for their um, approach with, um, you know, one of our largest, if not the largest, labor group that we have here in how they um, uh, reported back to us, engaged us, uh, engaged uh, uh, probation department and PPEO, and, and just put it all together. So thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo those comments. I really want to give sincere appreciation to everyone who entered willingly into good-natured conversations uh, that got us to what is really, frankly, a great outcome. Um, I don't believe Placer County has ever had a five-year contract uh, before, or certainly not within my recollection, though I'm still fairly new on the board. Maybe I'll ask Robert. But um, sorry, I have to take that poke every time. Um, but uh, really, thanks to all of you for, for your efforts. And I think it's, um, it's, um, it's a good platform for us going forward. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, we have a motion, Holmes, a second, Duran. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe that is all our department and timed items. We're now going to adjourn to closed session. County Council, please take us away. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session for a conference with labor negotiators to, I mean, with real property negotiators. We already did the labor negotiations. So. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to discuss two potential real property acquisitions that are listed on page three of the agenda. Uh, the board will also meet uh, in closed session for a public employee performance evaluation, county executive officer. Uh, as there are uh, no requests for actions associated with these matters, and. No action will be taken during closed session. Uh, therefore, we'll, we will not, or I will not be reporting out at the, after the closed session has ended. All right, and I'm going to um, ask everyone to leave the room so we can have closed session. And I'm also going to uh, give the board five minutes to visit the facilities, get a drink of water, have powder your nose, have, grab a protein bar or whatever it is, and we'll see you back here at noon. <laughs>